Um, right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to get my, uh, my, my other stuff done now, and uh, we, we will get started. I don't know why I'm looking at a video with uh, um, Nicola, Nicola Bully's um, best friend. Oh, I don't bloody know what that's about. But okay, okay, here we go. If we if we go on to this now, and then I can get us on, I can get us going. Right, it it does look good. Neolithic updates, Barrow Diggers Part Seven. It looks really good. So as as I'm as I'm mumbling in the background, right. As I'm mumbling in the background, um, have we got any news? Let's start off with Pat. Right. I have at least one sentence. Um, Colchester, a Roman mosaic discovered. And it's it's right in front of a vape, vape shop, you know. And <laughs> yeah, they got all these people, you know, looking in a hole, you know, trying to see what it is, you know. And um, oh, this is now. Yeah, just got it off the net. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh right, okay. Oh, oh, and, I, I, and I, see, I, it looks something like um I can't see. Something like that. See the little design? The mosaic. Yeah. Yeah. It's must be a couple feet down, you know, and I don't know how come they discovered it. You know, whether it's gas pipes or what, but but it's Roman. Oh, it's yeah. in Colchester and it's just discovered. Oh, oh wow! Oh, right. Okay. 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 <laughs> right. Okay. So, what am I going to? Because we've got to share this with everybody. We've got to do all the images. So, uh, what is it? The is it the vape shop? Yeah. Colchester. Yeah. Colchester yeah. Roman mosaic. Right under pavement outside vape shop. Hang on, shut up, you! Um, <laughs> I can't put all that in. Eh? Oh, right. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, right. So, what have we got? Oh my God! Workers started to unearth a Roman mosaic buried underneath a pavement outside a vape shop. Yes. 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 Oh wow! Oh, oh we're going to do that. No. Yeah. Oh. We're going to display it beneath glass. Is now <laughs> underway. It's underway to display it beneath glass. <laughs> You know, this is this is the way archaeology should be. That you know, you find stuff and people can see it forever because the people are starting to really think. Yes, we don't want to cover that. I'm loving it. Okay, right. I've got I've got this now. Pat, top max. I'll take you. I'll I'll buy you a coffee sometime. Sometime <laughs> using Pete's money. Uh, right. I'm loving it. Oh, what a great start. Talking about Pete. Go on. Oh, hey, it was back in 1990, they just, 1980, they discovered it, just covered it up. Yeah. And now they've uncovered it now, so you can see it. Yes, that's it. Oh, my God. Yeah, originally I... discovered in the eight, 1980s when services yeah. were being installed for the shopping center. But it was then over, mm. covered right. over, back over, and remains hidden. There we are. But now we're going to look at it through glass. Uh, hey. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. Can I? Can I just say? Can I just say something that I wasn't going to do today, but I am. Right. Um. Um. Ob obviously. Obviously, the house I'm building is coming to fruition. So uh, I've, I've just put the last of the frames in today, and um, <laughs> you know, whatever. Why that's got a relevance is I haven't been able to write any books or anything for the past two years. Um. So I'm. I, I've. Uh, I'll be coming out with a new book in the next six months. But I wanted to say, if anyone wants any copies of Romans in South Wales, we're down to the last 20. Um, and it's been such a popular book that we've we've sold about 800 of them in a year and a half. So if anyone wants a copy, they need to let me know because this is the last chance because we won't be reprinting it. This is the second, re this is the second print. So you see, as a Roman thing, I wanted to put that in there. Um, anyone wants one, they need to let me know. Right, um, Peter, let, let's see if um, you've got anything you want to tell us. Not me, no. All right, then we'll do the other one then. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got an article I found earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, some Spanish mathematicians weighing in on Stonehenge. Uh, last have it, year. Cool. Let's have it. Last year, Bournemouth University archaeologist Tim Darfield published his claim about the monument operated as some kind of perpetual calendar. Now, Polytechnic University of Man, math, uh, Milan mathematician Giulio Magli and astronomer Juan Antonio Belmonte from the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Island, Spain, have countered Darville's claim, stating it is based on a series of forced interpretations, numerology and unsupported analogies with other cultures. 
Mm. That's a bit of a slight on a prehistoric expert, isn't it? <laughs> it is a bit. Isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, uh, they they yeah. say, um, was it uh, the critical number used uh, number twelve used by Darville to multiply the number of lintels isn't reflected anywhere in the st structure. There is also a variety of other numbers represented throughout the structure, such as it is uh, such as in its portal, which seem to be ignored. Oh, so, in other words, we've got controversy now. Don't don't worry about the Spanish; they they'll out, they'll attack us anyway. <laughs> um, but mind, mind mind you, talking about Spain, right? Best of luck. Is it Scotland paying Spain tonight? And Adam Adam's excuse was he's he can't he can't seem to switch on to his laptop today. Um, so he's decided to sit and watch Wales um, uh, beat uh, Latvia instead tonight. So he's with us tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, that's a uh, that, that, that's Adam, that's Adam's <clears throat> and the uh, the other the other bit the other thing as well as I wanted to say was that um, 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 Gina's not with us today, but she's had her up and she should be with us soon. I, actually, what I'll do, I'll read, I'll, re I'll read out that message. I spoke to Gina today. She had her up on Saturday and in is in some considerable pain, no bloody wonder. Uh, they are having difficulty in finding suitable drugs for her. Oh, I got loads here, I'll send her some of mine. She is getting um, physiotherapy treatment. She was grateful for everybody's best wishes. I am nursing a headache just now and excuse myself of joining you tonight. Best wishes, Anne. Okay. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's fine. So I'll say, uh, jo join us tomorrow. Um, <laughs> all, our, all our best. All our best, gang. There you go. Yeah. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah, we're all part of the gang. Yeah, that's good. Oh, can I just, can I just mention like, what, what we've done? Uh, we've sent... Uh, Peter, I'll see you tomorrow morning as well. Uh, what, yeah. what I've done, we've, um, I've, we've, start, we've put Drina on our um, sending notes basically we've got a note system one of our students still has notes we never see her oh, she's called barbara um she still gets notes sent to her so what we've done we've copied those notes and sent them to trina as well so she'll have a load of notes sent to her in a post so um so yeah that's a that's the thing we're doing to try and keep her up to date so that's that yeah. so she is in touch with us um right did margaret say she had any news oh not really, just a, a link with cannibalism and mad cow disease. <laughs> oh, come on, let's have it. Don't just talk about it, man. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. My daughter-in-law was showing it me on her phone and it was something to do with humans that eat humans and some kind of link with mad cow disease. But I can't remember the rest of it. That's <laughs> that, that, not the, uh, the Kreutzfeldt Jakob? Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, did you know about that? It, yeah, there's certain um, certain groups. I can't remember which ones they are. I think I think the Jewish community has a, a, a quite a high number of it for some reason. Mm. And I, but I think they also found it wasn't in tribes in Papua New Guinea that used uh, to eat eat each other as to to uh, to absorb their knowledge and all the rest of it. And I think yeah. they had a high ca case of it, and they they managed to persuade them to change their culture. To not do that, right. but, uh, yeah. but it's a, a similar form of, of mad cow disease. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it isn't quite. Yeah. But if if that's what it was, but, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I can I just make a comment? Uh, my parents used to say before uh, before the age of like seven, I used to be a nice, quiet little boy. When we went to Cyprus in 1983, I had the oh no no it was a kinthos. When I went to the kinthos in 1984. Um, I had the opportunity of eating monkey's brain, right? So does that explain why I went a bit nuts after that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it could be, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, we'll leave that one. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. So I'm looking forward to doing the vape shop in a moment. Right, David, anything you'd like to tell us? No, I'm sorry. Okay, fair enough. Um, and the only one we've got left now is Andy Pandy. Which you've never, nobody's ever said that before, have they, Andy? No, funnily enough, no. <laughs> Who? No. Um, uh, no, I have, this, uh, I have nothing to add to this this week, I'm afraid. Okay, well, well, excitingly, we got to we got to go straight to um, we we've got to straight go straight. Let's go to the vape shop. <laughs> yeah, and we've got to go to the vape shop. And the other yeah. thing as well is, right, as usual, these lectures have gone straight off bloody tangent, right? 
Uh, you know, I really regret asking people to put feedback into these classes because I've been just not getting anything done. Um, right, so... Um, okay, it's a, so it's a Roman mosaic. You, you, you've, yeah. just, you've got to do it. Yeah, but it's Neolithic, <laughs> isn't it? It's a Neolithic yeah, absolutely. Roman mosaic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Inf influence, the, the design is. Yeah, the 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 um what <laughs> shut up classical oh, classical yeah. Yeah. the Neolithic mm -hmm. people influenced right yeah um, yeah Let's see there's a link there's a link the Neolithic people influenced right um the the mosaics of Colchester they're proving yeah. that the Romans never ever arrived in Britain in the first place is that right Adam <laughs> Adam's not here no yeah. uh, Peter the other, no I tell you what it makes it easier today right Peter uh, from Dartmoor's Adam today. <laughs> right. See, it makes it so much easier, doesn't it? So, I'm no. um, glad you glad you joined us, Adam. <laughs> oh, God's sake! Right, okay. What we're going to do? We're going to share on this now, right? Um, mm -hmm. We got we we got to we got to share. Oh my God, my, my head's gone. Right. Okay. Oh God. Right. Okay. So what have we got? Oh, there it is. The outside vape shop. Will expose glories of Roman hidden beneath the pavement of Colchester. Look at that! Mm -hmm. Hey, beautiful! It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, there's, there's this, there's this guy there now. Right, we've got to dig up the rest now. Who cares about the street? You know what I mean? Oh, by the way, what we got to do? Oh, I know, I know a way we can say, expose the rest of the mosaic. What we'll do? We'll invent a new, new utility that needs to go through Colchester. I tell you what, we got, we're going to put in Virgin. Um, we're going to put in a Virgin Express train link through Colchester, right? Meaning that we're going to dig up the rest of the mosaic and we can expose it all. Job done. That's it. Right. An unusual design, isn't it? That's kind of like a nautical theme in a yeah. town that's nowhere near the sea. Do you know what, Andy? You know what, Andy I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, is this actually Roman? Yeah. It, it, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite a small mosaic piece, isn't it? Like, doesn't it? Look, I mean, it's difficult to scale, but looks late. So, no, actually, I think that's that pretty big. It's the ocean, the waves, does it? And, and that, and that, that, yeah. color, that doesn't actually fit in with anything that I know about. No, I've not seen one like that before. And I, and I like me mosaics. I've looked at a lot. Oh. Hang on a minute. I, I can't even, I can't even fix this into it. Right, okay. Oh, I, I, uh, next time, Pat, keep it to yourself. <laughs> dig it up, dig it up. <laughs> dig it up, dig it up. Get, get rid of the vape shop. Vape <laughs> shop. Well, we've got an excuse to go because we're high on the vapes. Right. Workers started to unearth a Roman mosaic buried under a pavement outside a vape shop. The ornate design was originally discovered in the 1980s when, when services, uh, not church services, Pat, don't get too excited, uh, were being installed for the shopping centre in Colchester, but it was then covered back over and remained hidden. Now, I'm liking what we're saying about this now. A project to permanently uncover the mosaic at Red Lion Yard and display it beneath glass is now underway and due to be completed by the end of this summer. It's well worth it. Mind you, the last... Were you on that trip when we went to Colchester and people taking drugs and smoking all sorts of things? <laughs> yes, I think I was, yeah. Yeah, it was really weird. It's the first It's the first excursion that I've ever had that, that you go around the corner and you can see people... Um, um, jabbing needles in their hand with cocaine, offering it to us, and then Roger nearly going off with some. It's a really weird. Anyway, <laughs> so um, it comes, and I even went on BBC TV at, about that as well. It's brilliant. Anyway, moving on. We never, we were never invited back to Colchester for giving such a bad image of the town. Um, it comes after Colchester, the former capital of Roman Britain, gained city status last year. So there you go. We're loving it. That guy's got a beard as well. Are you sure that's not you, Pete? Oh, Adam, I forgot. <laughs> Martin Leatherdale, centre manager of Lion Walk, you can't make her up, shopping centre, said that displaying the tile art would help promote the city's Roman heritage. I've got to be honest with you. Can I actually just say this? When we went to, when we went to um, Colchester, right, um, you know, there's, there's not, there's not a great deal in the way of Roman remains in Colchester, really, when you compare it with somewhere like York. Um, it, you know, it's really spread out. You've obviously got the, um, you've got the gate, um, was it the Barbican Gate. You've got a couple of other areas where you've got gates. Mm. You've obviously got City Wall. Uh, you've mm. got the temp, uh, like a church, church converted, um, late sort of early church, sort of out of Roman temple. Uh, you've got the um, um, stadia. Uh, you've obviously got the the museum. You've got a couple of other bits and bobs, and you've got a theatre. 
Um, but it's not a massive lot in the way of um, stuff in Colchester, Roman wise. But I, it's so it's so good that they're allowing this now. And as I say, expanding our hunt. So I'm I'm loving that. I'm loving that they got a bit more a, a mosaic actually in the street that you can see. I think that's absolutely massive. That's an innovation. We need more of it. We really really do. Um, um, so here we go. We're uncovering what's already been found, and we're all. Or also exposing further than that. So there we go. We got more there. Um, oh, it's two bits. Oh wow. So in other words, that must be a utility pipe there. And that, that's obviously a copper pipe there. Oh no, what's that? No, it's not copper. It looks like copper. All right. Um, so here we go. Um, the amount of uh, the amount of traffic inquiries and in uh, an engagement that it gets is just off the scale. I've never seen anything like it. There's definitely an appetite out there for it. Do you know what? This is, this is, I'm love. I'm so loving this. I never, I didn't, this is, what was it? The press release was the 23rd of March. That's nearly a couple of days ago. So that's brilliant. Really appreciate this, Pat. You can go home now. Uh, there would be secondary <laughs> work to look at the moisture content of the ground, uh, which needs to be scientifically considered before encapsulation. Obviously, you know, there's different ways of doing this. Um, the exposing permanently of part of a decorated Roman mosaic in Colchester is a fantastic idea. Over 40 mosaics have, have been recorded over the past two centuries in Colchester. I am fairly sure there are more mosaics in Colchester than any other Roman town in Britain. And I, can I agree with that? Mm -hmm. Well, I th I wasn't think I Colchester can. associated with, with actually mosaics and a mosaic school? Mm. No, that was that was Carinian. That was uh, um, Sirencester. Ah, right. Okay, yeah. Uh, but, Thank but, you. Yeah, yeah, but you, but, you're right. You're right. Uh, and they, but there was the mosaic school of um, in, in and around London. So this isn't far, Andy. So let's give you half a mark for that anyway. But what I would say, you would be right in thinking that um, Colchester produced its own Samian ware. So you may have been thinking about that. So. Um, but I, I got to be honest with you, Andy. If you if you want to if you want to come up with a theory, this style is quite unique. So it, it might actually be a local a local a local wave. Though, excuse the pun. A, a local another thing. Um, Philip Crummy, director of Colchester Archaeology. I think he's been director for like fifty years. The exposing permanently of part of um, a decorated Roman mosaic in Colchester. It's a fascinating idea. We've done that. I am fairly sure. There we go. More mosaics than anywhere. Um, more mosaics in Colchester than any other Roman town in Britain. Sorry to repeat that, that but that needs repeating. And, I, and uh, as Andy jumped in there, I was thinking, I think that's, I think that's right. Actually, I actually discovered Roman mosaics. Um, you know, there might be other locations that have more mosaics, but so <laughs> far, Colchester is the one. Coloured mosaics are something that people associated with Romans and Colchester is not well enough known for its Roman heritage as it ought to be. That's what I was trying to say. I hadn't read that. I look forward to more projects like this. David King, related to Don King, leader of um, Colchester City Council, said it is glorious to see our rich history unveiled again. And I just think that's absolutely brilliant. I, I think that, um, you know, there's so much that can be said about that. You know, what we what we do see, you know, we've all come across this. We've It's like... Um, you know, there, there's there's like they say, oh, a, a Roman a Roman floor's been found, or, or or a bit of medieval wall, and or this and that's been found, and we always cover it up, cover it up. And to be honest with you, there's so much more we can do with this. This I, there's got to be honest. I've got to be honest with you. You know, you know, it comes to that point, doesn't it? The other week that I said about the standing stone, um, in in um. It was in an allotment um, in Bridgend. We showed you an image of it last week. Mm. And um, and basically, I, I said that they moved the stone. Well, I could have even left it there. Now the idea is to leave the archaeology in situ so we can see it. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Hereford Museum. A Hereford Museum actually has um, an archaeology section. Oh, well, yeah, it's basically library and museum. So you go up these steps and you go to the museum. If you're looking down at the floor right, of the steps, as you're going up the steps, you will not see the mosaics on the wall. They've got massive mosaics on the wall that have been taken from Kenchester, the, the Roman city nearby. The thing is, that to me is just, I don't know, what, you know, with a huge mosaic on the wall, side on, when it <clears> used to be flat, and you're thinking, well, 
you know, why do that? Why didn't you just leave it in situ and let people see it? Um, mind you, what they did, what they've done at Ambleside has been absolute abortion of, of trying to save the archaeology in situ because they, 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 uh, they've got the bits of wall and they allow sheep to graze over it and they destroy them again. So obviously those types of perspectives to try and display walls and stuff are, are probably not the best way to do it. What they did at Killian, sorry to go off on a tangent, what they did at Killian, they excavated the barracks and what they did, they covered the barracks up and they, re they reconstructed bits of the barracks on top of it. So you've got the ex original plan of the barracks shown above ground using Roman building material, the original buildings preserved underneath. They could equally do something similar to this, but it's so well preserved. Uh, that we need to see it. I need to see it. I want to see that. I really, really do. It's it's great. So what what I'm going to do? I really want to get into barrow diggers, but I, I I I what I yeah what I might do is go into the barrow diggers and do the two two pieces that I wanted to do afterwards because we've already we've we've already done a little bit of something else today. So if I do all the little bits before the lecture, it, it's going to be a little bit too broken up. So. What I'm thinking of doing is if we can just um, if we can go on to the barrow diggers now. Right. And, and then we, we look at the weird nuances of the barrow diggers. And then what we can then do is um, now that we've done the vape shop, we will be doing a white horse hill kissed, um, which would be quite appropriate after what we've done with the barrows today. Um, and then we've got. Um, in Ireland, we got the Dairy Banks of Low um, Loch Foyle, the B Dairy Banks of Loch Foyle. So that, that two, um, obviously the one in Ireland is Neolithic. I, I need, I haven't really done the barrow research on that, but we, we've got current archaeology to help me out with that. So that's a bit of a, um, um, that's a bit of a fudge. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at an image that we've seen before, and we're going to go straight on to images and, um, um, yeah okay image uh, gallery so we, uh, this is all familiar so oh there we go we've got an image of alice roberts for once why the hell does she keep like dying her hair silly woman <laughs> oh, okay uh, okay nice. she, shut up she reminds me of pat oh sorry <laughs> oh, oh yeah i forgot we got a we got a wales uh, latvia game today oh, sorry i just I, I i didn't mean to show that right okay then so what we need to do side on otherwise andy's going to be moaning Right, and if I can just, uh, where's the, um, oh, hang on a minute. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, we're, we're missing an image. Oh, we're missing an image, which is a bit of a shame. Right, anyway, so Ooh. so what we've got, we got Bateman. we got Bateman. we got, we got um, these little um, tablets that you left on archaeological excavations, Bateman. Um, Margaret wants to know more about Bateman. So this whole lecture today is for Margaret's sake. We're not really interested in anything that anyone else has got to say other than Margaret. Um, so Bateman. Uh, we go on to talking about rodents uh, um, and uh, voles and rats. And it's a really fascinating area of the Barrow Diggers um, episode that we've been doing. Right. So Bateman, there he is, Bateman. OK, we, we remember Thomas Bateman um, and this this guy digging up in Derbyshire, digging up loads of tombs. And we've got the guy. Remember the Barrow Knight, um, Isaac, um, in 1845, got him. So we, we, we've got sort of Bateman. Um, so what I want us to do, I, I'm just going to remind us of Thomas Bateman. Thomas Bateman was born in 1821, um, died in 1861. Um, he, the estate that he, uh, William Bateman, his dad, and obviously Thomas Bateman, um, um, sort of senior or whatever. So, uh, so there's two Batemans. Uh, so Thomas Bateman lived for 40 years, but he was an extremely wealthy man, very, very wealthy man. And on his, with all his money, he created wonderful things um, in, in regards to archaeology. So that's what we're going to do today. So if I can just show you a few images, that, that is Bateman's study. Um, wow. look at that um, human skulls he's loving it. Um, so what, what we've got is cabinets full of artifacts there's even um, if you look closely there there's even a statue of Lloyd George it's all there um, and um, do you know what I, I got this obsession with Lloyd George because I'm sure you know there's this idea that I'm related to him in the family um, and I showed them all 
did I show you my picture of Lloyd George hanging on my wall last week? I showed the ones on Wednesday that. <laughs> so Thomas Bateman, we love him. Um, Bateman often mentioned the presence of animal bones in his cans. Now, this is one thing that animal bones, we don't really mention animal bones much in archaeology. We don't mention animal bones at all, really. Uh, I, this has been a problem with um, all the lectures that I do, because in the written material, I, I'm usually presenting and I'm thinking animals. Where's the evidence of animals? Animals existed. You know, they, they really did. And in the Neolithic period, we, we've got a lot more mention about animal bones, but not yet. We, we need to look at those causeway enclosures. We need to look at causeway enclosures in the next couple of months. Uh, but mind you, we've got Otzi, the Iceman, next week, so they can bloody wait. So sometimes with the bodies, sometimes in the mound material. So we're talking about animal bones, like human bones, here, there and everywhere. Among the most singly and interesting animal bones were those of rats. Rats. Now, Thomas Bateman was fascinated by these rat bones. And you'll, you'll find some fascinating with fascination with this. The remains of water bowls found in profusion in many of his sites often in close proximity to internments, right? So if, if I, I gave you a bit of a, um, I gave you a bit of an equation earlier on, I basically said uh, loads of bowl bones, over there, there's gonna be human bones. That's basically the theory. Rat bones, a trail of rat bones, over there, there's human bones, right? Um, it sounds a bit bizarre, but it's not as bizarre as it think as it sounds, right? Haven't got the image with you with me today, but I'm I'm going to base. We'll just move on a little bit a minute minute. So uh, the, these are actually this is actually you know this is actually um, some of the um, wonderful um, plans the B low con, um, and the, you know this is this is one of those bits of work, um, and. You know, we, we've we've got we've got lots of re, some really nice images there. So we'll put that in the background. Um, and in the break, there are one or two mis, uh, images that have, have been misplaced. So I, I'm going to try and get them in back in afterwards. But can I just mention um, on an episode of Time Team? I can't remember what it was. It must have been I don't know one of the early ones about in the 1990s. And it was an episode and they were excavating in Scotland and it was a con and a stone con, basically um, stone sides, a stone lid base and whatever. And they found a human skull in there. And basically they, they found the, the, uh, the back of the cranium, right? Um, the back of the cranium, the, the front, the front area of the skull was gone. Right. And inside the cranium, there was bits of plastic, bits of uh, wood, bits of all sorts of things. Right. And the rat had been using the skull as its home. And the rat had been gnawing at the skull for a very, very long time. In fact, every generation blames the one before. Yes, the um, rats had been using that skull for a long time. And hence why Bateman's talking about these rats and, and so on um, in the landscape that he's excavating. Very important. Sometimes their positions are unspecified. At other times, definite relationships were observed. Can I just um, jump in you now? Bateman's excavating clearly between 1821, obviously that's when he's born, um, and 1861. So sometime in the eight, late 1840s, 1850s, up to late 1861. Um, the one point I would like to clearly make is not all archaeologists would make reference to rat bones even today. Not all archaeologists would make reference to animal bones at all. In fact, it used to be a rule when I used to go um, field walking with my students is never to pick up any animal bones at all because they would not give us any data evidence. They were not helpful on field walking exercises. So we wouldn't even record them ourselves, we'd just um, record pottery. But on archaeological excavation context, bones are very different. So even today, people ignore bones of anything other than human beings, which is what happens, which is a shame, really, because because our friend Bateman realized how important these bones were back in the day, back in the day. Um, so, so the one, the one thing that the one thing that uh, we will say um, at, at his at, at at his work, um, and if we go to if we go to this site, and uh, I'm just going to um, make sure I got the right reference. This is below, right? Below B E E low. This is um, th this is below. 
but we're referring to here at Briolo, which I don't think is too far away. Um, so we've got Bilo in front of us, Briolo, and other sites, human bones had been apparently badly gnawed by the rodents. At other khans, such as Eldon Hill, Musden Hill, and Bitchin Hill, skeletons were embedded and covered in water vol bones. Now, this thing about, again, I'm, I'm fascinated by this sort of link with bones, right? These little animal bones, right? And, and it, also, it also points to a, another, another issue that I'd like to mention. When we, when we visited, let's zoom in on this, I love it. Uh, when, when we visited um, as a little group, there was only a little small group of us, we, we went to a Barclodia de Garris on Anglesey. Uh, when we went there, um, there's talk there that when the archaeologists, archaeologists were excavating, they found little bones of, 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 of voles and rats and all sorts of things, right? Um, um, toad bones as well, they found. And they said, oh, this is evidence of, 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 of them making a, um, like, like a, there was a cauldron there and, 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 and there were witches there and, you know, and all the rest of it. And I simply thought, well, what if these animals just crawled in there and died? It's easy. This is what Bateman's saying. You know, Bateman isn't saying they're part of people cast in spells, as in Macbeth. Um, this is part of the real archaeology, part of the levels of archaeology. Yet some Khans surprisingly yielded no rodent remains. In others, certain interments were accompanied by vole bones and others were not. So in a, what Bateman's, what Bateman's see, see, saying is that there's a correlation with these rodent bones and the archaeology. Very, very much so. I just want to explain what this tablet is, a, a leaden label um, we enclose. One of Bateman's lead la tablets, a ritual he copied from Cole Hall and William Stukeley. Stukeley goes all the way back to the early 1700s. Note the spelling error common to all nine examples so far recovered. So Bateman, um, M-A-N rather than M-E-N. And he didn't even see that spelling mistake, or maybe it was deliberate. Um, talk, talking again about these, Bateman's evidence uh, shows that in some cans, masses, masses of rodent bones were available on, on site on the funeral day. Um, at Musden Hill, water bowl remains were blackened by smoke from a nearby cremation fire. At Blackstone's low, rodent bones occurred with a cremation in a cinrian all the bones were um, um, calcined. Basically, calcined means that they've been roasted or, or burned. Other rodent bones, uh, vole bones and rat bones, are just remains of rats that have been living in amongst the bones. In other words, what we're saying, what we're seeing is there's a nuance here. We're, we're seeing that um, rodents, uh, we, we, you never thought we'd have a lecture like this, did you? Uh, you never thought that rats and vole bones would be so important to archaeologists, but they, they undoubtedly are from what Bateman was seeing. Um, all these correlations with bones, some, again, let's just clar clarify that. Some bones were associated with the cremation practice, some bones were um, associated with the actual internment of the person, some some of these rat and vole bones were associated with rats, rats and voles living in amongst the human remains. Living in amongst a set of human remains would be fascinating because you all those all those weird little bones that human beings have got. You know, the, the skull bone was brilliant for a nest. Uh, uh, the 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 um, um, the long bones you could gnaw at them, all the little finger bones, all the little digits, and so on. You know. Um, a rib bone, you can imagine if the rib cage is still um, up, you know, and it's still sort of um, um, standing and it hasn't collapsed, you know, that could be a little chamber, um, you know, even a little chamber for mice. I'm now sounded a bit gory, um, not mice, a little chamber for a, a rabbit. Uh, it, it would appear that sometimes the bones had been placed in the graves deliberately. Perhaps they were part of a local diet. And so um, sometimes they appear to be natural, as it is likely the burial mounds were favoured by the rodents. Can we just mention that in, in when we've got um, um, when, when we've got um, evidence of of voles, uh, voles from the, the, the low countries on Orkney, what we what we see is that is evidence that that 
people had taken those voles all the way from the low countries to Orkney. Did they take them deliberate? Did they take them as food to Orkney? You know, um, you think about Romans and dormice, you know, dormice being fattened, uh, that being quite a delicacy. Um, you know, what we what we talk about, again, is, the, is this thing that, you know, Romans introduced like um, to people in this country. Let's go out and watch it. Let's go out and eat dormice. Um, and can anyone ever remember that series a few years ago? Chelms for one, two, five, I think it was called. It was like a, a spoof Roman series about um, a restaurant and cafe in the Roman period and so on. Really, really weird. Uh, and, and one of the things I'd like to say is that, that we're now talking about is there's different perspectives of looking at history. When you look at this early antiquarian stuff, it makes you think. This is why we're doing it. I, I wanted to do this antiquarian stuff because there's so much that that we that skills in archaeology that we we you know things that we've forgotten, you know. That that that's why we're sort of doing it. Uh, one other suggestion is that khans under construction are left open for a considerable period of time could have provided places, could have provided places on which owls or other predatory birds disgorged or dismembered their prey. So in other words, you, you've got another reason why you're getting loads of rats and voles. And, and, and back to what I would usually say in all my lectures um, is that, you know, there's loads of different reasons why there's these these little um, mammals in these in these contexts of human beings. Remember, we should be saying that in the landscape of archaeology, if we use the, the wording of um, Tim Ingold, interestingly enough, Bateman rarely found water vole bones in um, in Neolithic Roman or Anglian contexts, uh, but he found them in Bronze Age contexts. He found a lot of vole bones. Um, in a Bronze Age context in Derbyshire, there was abundance of voles in Derbyshire at, in the Bronze Age. And actually, bloody hell yes, because in the Bronze Age, it was much warmer. You know, when people are, oh, I've got to really stop myself in a minute because I'm going to slap myself across the face. When people go on about global warming and all the rest of it, you know, it's never happened before, you know, and global uh, warming is a, a human phenomenon and all the rest of it. You'll find that I don't agree with that. I think it's a natural phenomenon, very similar to what Neil Oliver has been saying as well. Um, uh, basically, back in the um, back in the Bronze Age, at least 4,000 years ago, temperature was about one and a half, two degrees higher than it is today. So it would have been perfect landscape for bowls to um, to sort of um, grow. And in other, in other words, uh, we've got another two degrees to go in Britain uh, before we get to um, prehistoric Bronze Age levels. So bring it on. Um, it's terrible for me to say that, but that's the way life is. It's a natural phenomenon. You can disagree with that. But that's how I feel. I need to stop myself there now before we get any controversial. Um, so when we think about rodent bones in the Bronze Age, uh, which is very important, much warmer, um, lasting long enough after that time to form deposits of large numbers of bones. So what we're seeing, what we're seeing, we're seeing actual whole, it, we're, we're seeing whole, um, you know, when you, you used to watch the Tarzan and the Apes and from the 1930s with that uh, German actor, um, I know somebody's come up with his name. Uh, there used to be elephant graveyards. There's vole graveyards as well. So um, vole graveyards. And then suddenly after the Bronze Age, by, by the year 1628 years BC, which is Thera, and maybe we see other eruptions as well of, the, um, uh, of, of that chain of uh, volcanoes in, in Europe. Uh, what, what we do see is that temperature drops in, in Britain and therefore um, voles become very much scarce. And it's not humans that wipe out voles. It's, it's temperature. And this is another thing as well, is when we talk about um, human beings having an impact on vole populations, we can clearly see in the archaeology that it's not, it's not human beings that wipe out voles, because clearly in the Bronze Age, there, there's thousands of them in these burial chambers, and they're just living there happily. Um, so, so you've got vole bone phenomenon, you've got, you've got rat bone phenomenon, right? I mean, other periods in the Neolithic Roman and Ang, um, um, in the um, post-Roman period, and obviously in the Bronze Age, the rat bone phenomenon was also remarked on by subsequent heat district diggers, such as Jewett, such as Bagshaw, 
and Pennington. We will, um, Pennington is a familiar name for me, for, but Hewitt and Bagshaw, th those, those are other uh, people of this genre that, that comment on rap bones. I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask just one of you randomly. Um, Andy, have you ever heard of, in any of your reading, archaeologists talking about rat or vole bones in the reading, excluding Orkney? No, never. And, and this is, this is, this is my fear because I fear that by ignoring these, these earlier antiquarians work, uh, we're not enriching our modern understanding of archaeology. And it's quite, it's quite amazing that Andy said never. And I'm going to say very rarely myself. So, you know, it, it's, hang on a minute. Why is there loads of rats and voles in Derbyshire? Are, are, are nobody actually recording this in the archaeology? Yeah, they, they, this is a question. This is a question there. Um, the author himself has noticed that considerable presence around skeletons in Khan's excavated by him, Bateman and Carrington, regarded their occurrence during digging as an almost infallible indication that inhumation burials were close by. Now that is that scientific? Is that what 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 is that? You know, it's just um mm, that's that's a rather interesting point. Isaacson, you know that the the, um, the Barrow Knight, obviously writing in his book of 1845, Isaacson, 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 Isaacson wrote of intent to find the bones of rats, for these afford a certain trail, which low explorers never fail. So remember, lots of these lots of these locations are called uh, associated with the word low, right? L O W. So that's that's a that's a direct link if you want to uh, retranslate that. Which barrow explorers never fail. So in other words, if you follow the the rat, if you follow the rat and the um, the vole the vole trail, right, you might be able to understand more. Of what's in front of you, I, I think. I think this point is absolutely massively important. Low there, L O W without the L E. So I'm think assuming that um, there's low and low E, but but obviously that's missed on that there. So this is the plan of Below Khan from 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 um, from Bateman's work. Ten years of digging, Bateman's woodcuts were well in advance of other barrow drawings in contemporary books. Now, this to me is rather interesting because you, you've got an association of animal bones there. That he's recording it. You've got a north arrow there. You've got a north arrow. That's useful. Very useful. We've got other evidence there. We've got the these all this really nice evidence here coming into frame. And I'm going to presume by the shape and form of these, this this is a bronze. This is Bronze Age, right? This is a Neolithic. This is Bronze Age. All the, all the characteristics of the Bronze Age. Um, interesting enough, note the area that's not been excavated. the The notes that I use for these lectures are by guy from a guy by the name of Barry Marsden. And Barry Marsden's name will come up again in regards to the Neolithic period, right? Barry, Marge, Barry Marsden says uh, that he excavated this site at Below in 1966, 1968. Um, and obviously more was found. I don't know if he's being critical, but if it wasn't for Bateman leaving the archaeology, Marsden would not have excavated the rest of it. And we don't always see that these one thing that seems to be coming out with these barrow diggers from this period is they don't always seem to be excavating everything. They don't seem to be leveling these mounds, right? Um, so they're leaving other archaeology for other people to excavate, which is a really important point. And, and, and leaving the archaeology for other people to excavate is helping us again advance and prove or disprove their, their early um, uh, dalliances with the archaeology in the 1840s. In 1848, um, Bateman's, um, so Bateman excavated a place called Gib Hill Calm. The occasional humorous incidents um, it, um, is revealed in Bateman's accounts of his labours. Um, and even though we've got plans, I think the point being major is so we've got plans like this. Um, occasionally, when 
excavation work is being undertaken. It's not always done with um, with uh, with health and safety in mind, because this next point um, is going to quite shock you. This is, this is the, um, in 1848, his party dug into the huge Gibb Hill Khan, a big, huge Khan, uh, an undertaking that lasted seven days. Now, you can imagine, you know, you've got, you've got four diggers there and Bateman, and it's, it's, it's slightly, um, the scale slightly out there, as you can probably appreciate, but, uh, you know, this is typical of, of the genre, sort of 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, the human figure is under exaggerated and what you're looking at is over exaggerated or if they put everything yeah um so so large was the mound that a tunnel was driven into its side um and this illustration that you're looking at is an illustration of of uh, illustrations of antiquity shows this tunnel supported by timbering so looking at that image, you're thinking, well, OK, they're, they're, they're supporting it. You know, they're, they're, they're digging and they're digging a tunnel into the mound. Right. It's really difficult to get a perspective of what's going on because we don't have cameras. Photography is going to only be coming in in a couple of years time. So we, we haven't got a photography yet. When no internments came to light, the supports were knocked away um, preparatory to filling in. Right. The roof of the tunnel immediately collapsed, bringing down the rest of the mound. <laughs> bringing down two orthostats of a large limestone kist. So in other words, they, they, had, they had dug underneath the archeology, span right? So they, they ripped out all the timber and, and the roof of the tunnel immediately collapsed, bringing down Two of the stats, a large limestone kist revealed in the upper structure of the Khan. Um, a food vessel from inside the kist also fell into the tunnel. Fortunately, no one was injured in this collapse of the internal part of the mound. Do you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, thinking um, how many, how many people actually died in these excavations because they sound absolutely lethal. Because. When, you, when you're talking about them, they're rushing these things. This is a seven day excavation, but they've, they've, they've tunneled it. They've, they've put all the props and everything in there. There's clearly four people working there, probably about six, seven, eight people. Uh, Bateman could afford it. Um, but so, you know, fortunately, no one was injured. However, um, the the, uh, the, inter the internal part of the mound completely collapsed. So, uh, yeah. It doesn't sound good, does it? What this? I, I hope he learned from that one. Describing a skull found by his father at Kenslow, Bateman's father, William, perhaps influenced by the growing interest in phrenology, uh, remarked following Dr. Hibbert's report that it exhibited uh, phrenological developments indicative of some of the worst passions um, incident to human nature. This opinion of the unfortunate long dead individual leads us to regret that modern anatomical reports are not so entertaining. So in other words, people are actually starting to uh, look at the bones and understand their association. Um, so obviously what we've got, we've got this huge collection here uh, where people have got, yeah, there we go. We've got a whole collection of human skulls uh, and we've got the bones slotted underneath. Can you imagine having a drawing room like this today? Can I can I tell you a little story? Right, I I used to um I used to live in a flat in Barry, right, and um and um and my my daughter um used to I my my two daughters stay and one used to stay on the top bunk, and um one used to stay on the bottom bunk, and I actually forgot that under the bed was a human skull and there were long bones and a full set of human remains under the, my daughter's bed, right. So um, she went under the bed one day and she took the skull out and um, and she she didn't tell me. Right. And she put it back and she was playing with the long bones for a while. Um, and then she, she put them back under the bed. And then um, and then I didn't know that rats had gnawed their way into the bedroom. Right. And um, and rats had come up from the floor and they'd gone, gone into the bedroom. And at night, my daughter. Uh, would be seeing some of the bones moving around the room and uh, she thought they were the little people 
Um, and she only told me this and she thought it was completely natural that bones were moving around the bone because there was a set of human remains in the room. And that's a true story. Is that anyone still there? Um, some of Bateman's excavations seem highly dangerous to the diggers. Uh, near Gotham, his labor, laborers cleared out a rock grave sunk nine foot below the Khan surface, including four foot into solid rock. At the bottom of the grave, by the help of a candle, part of a human skeleton was obtained from beneath an immense stone, which could not be removed. So in other words, you know, not all not all of these things are done um, um, as well as we feel that Bateman was was meant to be doing his work. Um, but, you know, you can you can see that this is this is actually a little bit similar to the one that we, we mentioned collapsed and, and but. Uh, this this is this is another image altogether. Other deep graves uh, were excavated at a place called Shuttlestone, um, Parwick, uh, six foot below the ground surface, and at Endlow, six foot in in the limestone rock. So in other words, they just kept digging even in the rock, even though there, there was no chance of finding anything, um, because he left people to dig, which was unfortunate. On Burton Moor. Three skeletons were exhumed by undercutting the mound immediately below the junction of three field walls. So in other words, they just dug mines, they, 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 they dug mine shafts um, into these archaeology. So they, so, you know, you can imagine people, how they got away with this, I don't know. Bateman again relied on candle power at um, Rusden Low, where a grave was found at dusk. So in other words, they're excavating in tunnels in the dark with candles to find artifacts. Owing to the lateness of the hour at which this internment was found, we were obliged to clear out the grave by candlelight. The illumination provided by this method of lighting must, one feels, have been somewhat inadequate to say the least. Yeah, I would go with that. While most of the excavations were planned affairs, he describes one casual dig when a stone circle dull tall was discovered during a stroll near Stanton Moor. Yeah, we, 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 ah, by the way, I've got to remember, we've got to do Stanton Moor again. Hang on a minute. Um, Stanton Moor. Right, we've got to do that. Um, hang on, carry on. Where are we? Stanton, uh, Stanton Moor. Um, the party, uh, the small uh, party um, bor borrowed tools from the nearby farm and hacked out the center of the site. <laughs> so, not all of these things were done properly. It seems it seems one minute Bateman is doing is doing wonderful plans like this, and then he's decided to put mine shafts into these bloody things, and then then he's finding some archaeology and taking the stuff out, and all the bloody things collapsing, losing some of the archaeology as well. But we're learning, aren't we? Um, yeah, we're learning, just as I did years ago, didn't I, uh, Pete? Digging a barrow. Moving on. Um, Another guy called Samuel Carrington um, was Bateman. Sam was a guy called Samuel Carrington. He was he um, he lived from 1798 to 1870. He was one of Bateman's sort of prodigies, Bateman's lieutenant in Staffordshire. He lived in, he lived until 1870, um, nine years after Bateman had died. A village schoolmaster and a smallholder at Wheaton. He was described by another chap by the name of Roth Smith as a very intelligent man, a good geologist and an enthusiastic excavation of tumuli. He noted, um, seldom are such men appreciated. And I fear he was not an exception to the fate of the worthy unselfish poor. Carrington appears to have begun working with Bateman in the spring of 1845, a love that would continue for 25 years. Some useful information on his operations appeared um, in a large manuscript volume in his neat handwriting, once in the Bateman collection. Um, so in other words, you know, Bateman's collection. Now, Bateman's collection en ended up in the Derby Reference Library. The, the, uh, the body of the volume is taken up um, by a play on a barrow on barrow digging, almost certainly inspired by the works of Wolves and Isaacson. Isaacson, again, with his with his barrow knight. It is titled The Barrow Diggers Restitution of the Lost Archives of Ancient Britain. Also a defense of the noble science of barrow digging and archaeology in general. So in other words, they made whole plays about this stuff, whole plays about these collections, you know, um, on the backdrop of, of, hang on a minute, hang on, there we go. Uh, 
on the backdrop of of having um one of one of Bateman's sketches you well it's a good drawing look it's quite very good quite detailed a fine drawing of a Khan section in 10 years digging again um for um uh, it's far superior in depiction of others of the time it shows a primary skeleton in a kist uh, with a second urn placed on the earlier capstone so in other words what we're talking about the one that we described earlier when they put a mine through they they completely forgot that there was another burial above it Right. This is not unusual in, in the Neolithic period that you might actually uh, that, that, that um, oh, God, let me let me let me get let me get let me get my words out. So basically, when, when you go to um, when, when you look at some of these sort of subterranean structures, like there's one on Minehow, not Micehow, Minehow on Orkney. It's the other side of the airport, not Micehow, Minehow. And you go down and you go down these steps and. Um, <laughs> I think it's 19 meters or something. I can't remember. Anyway, go down these steps and, and you, you go down a little bit and there's like a little area uh, where there's where there could have been something placed and you go down more steps and there's another area. It, it, it's almost as if these things are multi-layered um, for internments. They're, they're, it's a vertical internment rather than um, a horizontal internment. And this is what we're clearly seeing with this illustration. Um, so I know you might think it's silly that that we that we're talking about archaeology being placed into plays and being placed into the narrative, but I don't think it is because you know um, I do my lectures now, as you full well know, with a bit with, with a bit of joking and you know with with a with a bit of sort of a non seriousness, and then we go on to the seriousness and then we learn stuff. Right, this is what I believe. Um, you know, you can imagine you can imagine people switching off completely and thinking, oh, my God, I'm really not interested in that. Right. Um, but in, in other areas, you, you, you if you if you narrate this and, and you, you put it into um, a subtext of, of humor, um, then history and archaeology can really come alive. And I think that's really important that they were doing it back then. Um, it's a bit like time team, isn't it? The reason why we've got um, Tony Robinson. Tony Robinson's doing Time Team again for the 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 Time Team YouTube thing, paid for through Patreon. It's 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 really good. Um, you can get that online, but you've got to um, pay to join the YouTube channel, which is only fair enough uh, because they've got to do sort of full episodes and stuff. But um, but people used to be really critical about Tony Robinson doing Time Team, um, but I wasn't. I thought it was brilliant. And Tony, Tony Robinson was a qualified archaeologist anyway. So back to this play, back to this um, long-winded play, um, the, the Barrow Diggers Restitution. The play itself, written in 1851-1852, is a laboured and turd, um, turgid work, but it contains some interesting observations and information. Chief characters are the first and second Barrow Diggers. The first is obviously Bateman. And the second likened to a lesser satellite revolving around a far greater orb is just as uh, certainly Carrington himself. It, it could even be Isaacson. It could have been lots of these other people. So in other words, we've got the main digger um, and the sub digger. Right. And, um, and he, can I just can I just tell you what that means um, when when I'm. Um, when I'm directing archaeological excavations, you, you very rarely see me actually do any work um, because it, it's so intense trying to um, organize an excavation. But when any, everybody's gone home, I'm on my hands and knees digging and, and working out people's mistakes and sort of doing the work, recording stuff. Right. So I've done stuff at the beginning. I'm supervising through the day and I've done stuff at the end. And then I've got to close down the excavation, do the other 90 percent of work that's involved in archaeological excavation. So. I, I see that analogy, right? So the person who's, who's the digger, uh, the main main archaeologist, and then you've got everybody else. So the narrative contains some shrewd co comments on digging, mainly gleaned from actual experience. In the text, Carrington noted that he had dug, dug, dug 135 cans between spring 1845 and autumn 1852, though this must be must include reopenings. So in other words, we're talking about excavating a tomb. And then going back doing more. So in other words, the figure's not 135 at all. It's 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 probably about 80 or something. So they've gone back and done more work. So I think that's a really interesting point. Among other things, he remarks on the camp followers who come to observe the digs and who are disposed to laugh at them 
for what they call following a queer business. So in other words, the archaeologists, you know, everyone, you know, these camp followers, you know. The thing is, um, in many ways, you guys do in archaeology today, people say, oh, that's a really queer thing to do, you know, looking at looking at sort of things from the past, you know. The jokes, the jokes on you. Um, and the joke is also on them, simply because we get the last laugh because we are learning about the past and we're learning not to repeat repeat the mistakes of the past when people just keep making age old mistakes. So we're we're far better than them. And this is what we're seeing with, with these works in the 1800s. This is what we're seeing today, especially as one of his um, characters comments on the rewards of barrow digging by revealing they find nothing but bits of flint and rotten pictures all over scratches and the potter's fingernails. Oh, uh, we only dream of that. One of Carrington's truisms is worth quoting. No one ought to open a barrow that does not as many eyes as an Argus and everyone wide awake. So in other words, you've got to really look and you've really got to study. This is the work of the archaeologist. Do you know, I, I've been thinking really recently, it's just I'm thinking anyone feels that they can be an archaeologist, but um, no, they can't. Archaeology is years and years of actually learning skills, observation, understanding. Um, you know, I, um, I I was doing some excavation work really recently and I, do you know what, I, I was, I'll, I'll tell you this little bit of a story. I, I was, uh, I, I was excavating and I found a soil layer that was actually, which was actually the group which was actually elsewhere um is the regolith which is you know which which is you get bedrock regolith you've got the uh uh you've got the subsoil and topsoil so bedrock regolith regolith is a broken down stone and whatever and it's full of sesky oxides it's full of sort of iron whatever um, and then you've got the subsoil and the topsoil so i thought this is, isn't right um so I, so i thought this is not right i went with a hunch i went with an archaeological hunch so I dug through this layer and all the stuff underneath had been disturbed. Right. And I thought this isn't right. So what had happened is somebody had um, somebody had scraped away of the area of the land. Right. Um, and and basically they would got down to this sort of regolith layer. They scraped it all up, dumped on top of another layer. Right. Um, sealed that layer. Um, and that's why it looked like you were down to the natural time team they'd call it the natural but when you get to the natural it's not always the natural because i had a, a and i went down another two foot and i haven't finished and i got down to a floor layer um a floor layer probably of a, a post-medieval building I got down to a floor layer and i and i stopped excavating i thought right i need to stop excavating now uh because i i need to um, assess the archaeology and there's one other weird thing i'd like to share from you from another report that i've not published yet from flemingston and fairly morgan when we were when we were excavating Flemingston and Vela Morgan, we 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 had um we had we had a thin layer of topsoil, and underneath that there was a subsoil layer, and the subsoil layer was full of medieval pottery. When I say full of medieval pottery, it was stinking. It was full, right? And I thought there's something not quite right here because I I thought I thought there was a um a, a Tudor wall underneath here, the Tudor period, 15, 1600s, right? 1485 you want to be precise um so going to the end of 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 the reign of um elizabeth I, um 1604 um so i thought right okay no that can't be right so um i ordered everybody to collect all the uh, we sieved everything anyway um and i said right th it, technically this would mean that we've got to the layer below the tudor but no the tudor was below the medieval because what had happened is somebody a few years back probably about 100 years ago they dug into a medieval site and dumped the soil on top of the tudor site to build at the level um and that's why we've got loads of medieval pottery medieval period is is before tudor period so you know um you've got to you've got to be awake and you've got to really understand so when time team would say we've got to the natural it's sometimes not always the natural Although only Bateman, back to the text, although only Bateman uh, records Carrington's excavations from the beginning of 1848, between that date and 1858, the latter dug into some 100 burial mounds. So in, in 10 years, 100 burial mounds. Um, so if you want to work out, that's uh, 
So that's 10 a year. It's not bad. Uh, mostly in Staffordshire, not including numerous reopenings of tumuli previously explored by him. So we've got Staffordshire and um, um, we've got Staffordshire being the work of Carrington and um, and we've got a Bateman and we've got mainly Bateman Derbyshire. But mostly in Staffordshire, we, we go on to Carrington, not in, including uh, numerous reopenings of tumuli. His work tailed off after 1851, probably because most of the Khans in his area um, had by then been rifled. The latter part of Carrington's manus manuscripts contains letters sent by him to Bateman describing his work on Bateman's behalf and listing the costs incurred for labourers and a recurring item. And does anyone know what that reoccurring item is, which is essential to archaeological excavation, Margaret? Come on, Margaret, what would you put a bill in for, for an archaeological excavation? Sorry, what was that? Right, what, what is the reoccurring thing that an archaeologist needs on an archaeological excavation? Think of time team and Phil Harding. A reoccurring thing, I don't know. Ale and beer. Ah, <laughs> right. Ale, 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 beer and a, a, and a pie. So there you go. <laughs> you, you can't go wrong. We, you can, yeah, you, you should have thought of, I, what I should have done is I should have... Um, um, I, 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 oh God, the name was in my head. Who was that guy? Fred Dibner. He used to like his beer and his his pie. His pipe, he did. Beer I'm and just, his pie. I'm beer. just looking at that. Um, you've got the image of Ballad and Moor, the section of the barrow at Ballad and Moor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, is, yeah. It, is that kind of two layers? I noticed there's like an urn with a supporting a lintel. Yeah, that... it, 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 yeah, it is actually two layers. Basically, um. But basically, you've got a side on view. So that is actually the mound there on the top. Right. So it, it's it's actually it's actually a vertical section rather than the horizontal section. I know it's very confusing. Uh, the, right. Basically, the urn, um, the capstone would have flattened the urn if it was that close. Mm. Right. So there's probably a little bit of space there. Oh, okay. um, and I'm going to I'm going to actually I'm going to actually. Um, call a friend and say that the urn would probably be upside down inverted uh -huh. because an urn would really struggle to stay up upright like that it would have collapsed by now so i'm going to go with an inverted hmm. um that there is the human remains on the bottom yeah so there's nothing so actually in the urn it's just there yeah there would yeah there would be cremated remains in the urn yeah all uh, oh, right so it's a cremated burial on top of an inhumation burial okay right so when we went to the when we, if you can remember the early ex, the, the earlier description they 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 dug into if we if we go back to that other image so what they're doing they're finding remains in there mm. right earlier remains and what they're doing there and if you if you think about if if you juxtapose the two and mm. you're thinking that is what they're finding below there and then what's happening is the orthostats which are the upright stones and the capstone are then um, are then all collapsing into what's down below because they've taken the supports out, right? Which so was that, a really... could, that could even be Anglo-Saxon remains in the top layer, then, couldn't it? Um, if this was in Kent, yes, but this yeah. isn't in Kent. Okay. That is that is clearly a um, that is clearly clearly um, a Bronze Age or okay. beaker pot from right. approximately um, four thousand five hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked about that. To be honest with you. I really, really, really am glad. Um, so, so we did mention about significant, significant to relate the cost of two men and a boy for one day was three shillings and three pence, which, to be honest with you, um, that's quite a lot of money. Bloody hell, these diggers were on a lot of money, to be honest with you. Well, you'd give the boy a penny, wouldn't you? And <laughs> but I think out of that three shillings and three pence per day, you would have to take out all the other stuff, all the sustenance and stuff. For one man, a five-hour stint paid is uh, paid one shilling. So, so one man, right? So, on other situations, um, a five-hour stint. So, cut what we said: three shillings, three pence for one day, two men and a boy. So, on other circumstances, one man, one man, and a five-hour stint. Um, was paid one shilling and um and a little beer. 
Yeah, so a little beer, not a little beer, but a little uh, um, an amount of beer. So there we go. It's got to be done. I've got to be done. I personally, I'd go for a cup of tea. You know, evidently Carrington paid small sums for flints found during during digging, and sixpence was given to um, given to some nameless individual for finding Barrow and getting leave. At Mare Hill, he had three men hard at work from noon till night, as well as one that assists of his own will. Oh, that's a volunteer, isn't it? We know them in archaeology, loads of volunteers. Carrington also provided the original version um, of the oft-quoted dig where the excavators found an urn deliberately smashing it and distribution distributing the pieces among the dig diggers as mementos. Flipping egg. I didn't read that earlier on. I'm actually quite shocked. Right, Carrington. I, okay, Carrington working on... Right, Carrington also provided the original version that excavators found an urn and then they smashed the urn up so each of them could have mementos to go home with. And, and there was... Ah, right, it wasn't Carrington. There was a culprit known as Thomas Meacock of Waterfall who dug on Carlton Hill finding bones beside breaking up an urn with their hacks, the fragments of which were distributed among these rustic antiquaries. The colossal carn at Steep Low, already mentioned by Isaacson, was dug into from time to time, but its very size foiled Carrington's attempts. At length, he, de he determined on a full-scale assault by employing two men um, continuously working for 14 days. Bloody hell. Um, and this is... Um, God, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? That, that's quite a big excavation for 14 bloody days. Two men continually working for 14 days. Not on this one. This is another site. This is um, this is Mons Monsdale Dale. Um, going, yeah, as he himself could not be there in person all the time, he arranged that if they met with an, any internment, they will set up a signal, as I can see the barrel from the school window. <laughs> Unfortunately, this prolonged operation was, like its predecessors, unfruitful. Though the gallant pair opened a, a yard wide cutting down to ground level to the center of the massive tumulus. Ah, uh, you can see what's going on here. They're just digging. That's 14 days worth of pay. They might just be, they might just be destroying everything anyway. Once when opening a car, Carrington found an extensive skeleton which seemed of recent date. Oh, right. I remember. Yeah, I remember doing my research on this earlier on. I just thought, right, OK, I needed to do this. Right. Um, they, 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 they actually found a murder. Um, so here we go. Start again. They, 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 they were digging. They, 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 unfortunate. And they, there was a prolonged interment. There was a prolonged excavation. Nothing was found. Right. Um, and there was another site. Right, that these diggers were excavating, not this one. Once when open in a can, Carrington found an extended skeleton which seemed of recent date. Two old people in the neighborhood informed him that the burial was that of a suicide, one Francis Brown, who had hanged himself. It appears that Brown had been wrongly suspected of taking his own life as years later, two criminals had confessed just before their excavation at York that they themselves had robbed and murdered the unfortunate man. That is quite shocking, actually. And the reason why, I will tell you in a moment. I remember reading this earlier on. I'll tell you in a moment. Right? That's rather interesting because um, this person could not be buried in consecrated ground because he had taken his own life as a suicide but it turned out he'd been bloody murdered shocking shocking um and this is a thing um 
when you're excavating an archaeological site, how do you know that the human remains that you're excavating are, are actually old or not? Very interesting to note that. We're gonna we're gonna have a break in a moment, but I just wanted um, I, I just wanted to um, discuss discuss a little bit more. Um, we've got a chap by the name of James Ruddock, but this is rather interesting. This is um, this is actually a, a woodcut um, published in Bateman's work. He also got another chap in called Llewellyn Jewett. Llewellyn Jewett, another skillful wool cut woodcut. This was by Llewellyn Jewett. Uh, this was in Bateman's work, um, showing one of Bateman's Khan plans. So the straight cut sections and the perfectly preserved skeletons should be treated with some suspicion. Maybe the youthful burial um, in the kist at the top, however, was in good enough condition to be rearticulated and placed in a glass case. Flipping. It's quite shocking, we, we, you know, but again, you know, we got shock and all and we just got try to really understand, you know, the mindset of this. And, um, you know, we, 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 we the, the point to be made there, we, we're sort of critical about, uh, we're, we're somewhat critical about, you know, was this how it looked, you know, and, and then then we look at reconstructions of, of, of archaeological work today and we get really con confused with what is actually genuine or not and what is um you know what's going on um yeah it could have looked like this you never know maybe it was a really well preserved um set of human remains about but in that we've got one set of human remains that was in a, such a good state of preservation that was put on display so why couldn't the rest have been the same Carrington was always loath, um, was always loath to leave any partly revealed burials overnight for fear of interference to them by casual curio hunters, as as we've mentioned before. He mentioned helping James Ruddock on certain diggings near Pickering in 1848. The pair left the kist and the cremation it contained overnight, intending to excavate it fully the following morning. I know from I know from previous experience it's not good leaving human remains for another day or for more than a day. Although they were on the site by 4 a.m., they found that the kist had already been rifled. When late one evening, Carrington found an undisturbed chamber in the Neolithic uh, round Khan at Long Low. He sent a hastily scribbled note to Bateman, written late at night, stating that he intended to open it as soon as light in the morning to prevent mischief. Carrington appears to have been a most conscientious and worthy servant of Bateman. It seems that Carrington's doing lots of the work. He had a deep interest in archaeology and proved a scrupulous and enthusiastic antiquary archaeologist. More than once, he apologised in his letters to Bateman for his lack of success in certain car openings, as though the fault were personally his. His defence and respect of his part-time employer came out in his des description of a character of the first barrow digger in his play. So in other words, we're talking about how this all, all works in the sense of the play. So what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to take a break there now and uh, some some shocking revelations there. Uh, but I'd like you to sort of think about this and we'll, we'll have a little bit of a discussion, a little bit more about the Barrow Digger after the break. Uh, there's an image missing within this section. I've got to try and find out where it is. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a break now and. Um, Let's uh, let's let's go. I've, I've only heard from Margaret throughout the whole lecture. I think everyone's just gone. I think I've, I think they've all gone over to um, uh, David's house for a point. Mm. I don't know if anyone makes. Oh, uh, it, it, well, uh, Peter looks like he makes his own ale. Oh, I wish. Right, talk, talking about ale makers, um, Andy. 
<laughs> no. 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 It's good. It's interesting. I can't believe how many people dug up so many <laughs> barrows. <but laughs> I still, still find it surprising. I think it's got amazing there's any left. <laughs> Can I make a comment about the legendary Claire? Do you think mm. if she was a barrow digger back then, she'd have a whole basement full of human remains? The answer is yes. Oh, and definitely, yeah. yeah. You, you can imagine, you can imagine in the kitchen, she's like, oh, by the way, the, the, um, um, the, 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 the coffee's underneath the human skull. Right, Pat. Um, I wanted to tell you, um, I won't be here next week. I'll be on the Isle of Man for four nights. Oh, fantastic. We want to bit we want to bit of Neolithic back from there. Is, there. is there anything I should look at or see? Oh, yes. uh, well, you Isle of Man, end of story. You need to go into any of the Viking museums and you need to go into any of the church graveyards, go into as many church graveyards and see Viking carved standing stones in the place that they're meant to be. Wow. Uh, you, you haven't got long there for days, so uh, just church graveyard museums blitz them. Okay, okay. But I know you'll be, I know you'll be Vikinged out by the end of it, but that's life. <laughs> David, anything you want to say from your kettle? I can't hear you. <laughs> no, he's over by the kettle. All right, um, <laughs> right. So we've only got we've Adam. Anything you want to tell us? <laughs> no, I'm just going to get the kettle on. Yeah, kettle. Do, do, do you know what I did earlier on? I, I um. I got two cups. I got two cups alongside me. I forgot I put the old tea bag into the other cup. <laughs> so I, I poured. I put a coffee into the one, and I thought, "Why is why? What's wrong with the coffee?" So, <laughs> so I was stirring the coffee in the lecture, thinking that the, the coffee had congealed at the bottom. I'd only broken the bloody tea bag up. Oh no! Oh, grim. Yeah, yeah, grim. I got. Yeah. I got. Yeah, I got. I got stuff in my tongue and my teeth. And my, I don't know why I got on my beard. It's there. Uh, oh, God. Um, um, so we've done everybody now. Um, oh, Pete, Peter, uh, the other, Peter actually wants to say something before we have a break. Go on, Pete. Oh, by, by the by the way, whilst Pete's looking, oh, I got to see if Wales is actually um, how Wales is doing. Um. No, we'll just we'll just have a quick look at how, how, how we're doing in the Wales game. Come on, Pete. Anything you want to say? No, it's fine. <laughs> I wonder right, how, how many. I don't know what the population was in Neolithic times, but did the, did everybody go in a barrow, or was some thrown in? Okay, hang on, before you say anything, Wales is winning. Wales oh! is winning. <laughs> right, sorry. Um, sorry. What's that, Margaret? I can't remember. What did I say? <laughs> oh. Was everyone buried in a barrow? Was everybody in Neolithic times buried in a barrow? I don't know what the population would have right, been can, back then. Right, actually, we need a logical answer on that. We need an answer if we never do this when we need to do this one. Right, sorry, sorry, guys. I know you want your break. I want my break, but right, okay. Um, if we, what we're going to do, we're going to go to. Um, you bet you shouldn't have asked this. You've got an individual lecture. We, um, what we're going to do, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the whiteboard, which we haven't done in ages. Right. OK, whiteboard. So in other words, what we're talking about, what we're talking about in, for example, if we go to the Mesolithic period. Right. Uh, we now know from the evidence in Ireland that in the Mesolithic period, they had inhumation burials, which are basically human beings laid out in various different whatever. And we do know from Ireland that they had cremation burials. Yeah. Now, we do know now that in the Mesolithic period, they not only buried them in caves, they buried them outside. Right. So by the time we get to the Neolithic period, um, which has ended by um, 8,000 8, years ago. But in the Neolithic period, um, which, which is, oh, God, my head's gone. No, I did that wrong. I did that wrong. I meant the Mesolithic period ended 8,000 years ago. Thank you for the correction. And then the Neolithic <laughs> period ending 4,500 years ago. That's what we're doing now. Carl, you're jumping ahead of yourself, right? So basically, in the Neolithic period, what we're seeing is that we're seeing towards the end of the Neolithic period, we're seeing cremation burials, right, into the Bronze Age, right? Now, Neolithic, Neolithic period, you get something known as sky burials, right? Sky burials take a number of different forms. Sky burials take, take basically a causewayed enclosure where you've got a wooden platform, Bodies exposed, exposed on a wooden platform, skull, <coughs> long bones collected, put um, either in ditches of the causewayed enclosure 
all placed on spikes. So you'd you'd have a head, human head on a spike, um, and you'd go up to that spike, and that person would look out of the landscape as you're farming. You'd go up to that head, and you you'd smooth it, and you'd say, you know, how are you doing, Uncle? Eventually, the the jaw would fall down. That skull would then be placed into a pit. So people's heads on spikes in the Neolithic period, then it's not trophies. Uh, they're your loved ones on spikes. Okay, they're looking out on the landscape and whatever. Right. So that's that's sky burials. Um, then you've got sort of inhumation burials in the Neolithic period. Um, um, you're not always getting a full representation of human remains in the Neolithic period. Basically, some people are buried, some people ain't. If you look at your modern families, uh, Margaret, and, and sorry if this is upsetting or, or it's not, you might... Uh, you might have people in your family who are buried. You might have people in your family who are cremated. You might have people whose cremations are placed out at sea and you never see anything of the cremation. You might have the cremations put into um, a bur burial ground. Or you might have the cremations put into your garden or on your mantelpiece or whatever. Right. Um, in that way, right, what we're seeing, not, not in, in, say, a thousand years time, you're going to see, right, um, there were seven, 70 million people living in Britain, right? What happened to those 70 million people? You're going to probably find out that maybe uh, 10 million were buried. Um, we can trace where 20 million people went and the rest of them, we don't know where they went because um, they were placed out at sea on all these other things, right? So in other words, the answer to your question is, as I've answered it, um, people were buried in so many different ways and people were buried without trace mm. in periods in the prehistoric period. Um, for example, um, I'm not going to dig into um, Peter's experience. He can volunteer that experience. But um, did Peter uh, witness people being buried at sea? Um, so those bodies were never, ever recovered again. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how a burial at sea would work because I've never experienced it. And do you still do burials at sea? The point is, is that um, you're not always going to get a full representation. And finally, and finally, one other thing that we're going to find one other thing. We didn't really need this at all today. Uh, but um, one, other, one other thing, one other thing that I would say um, is that, you know, um, in the Neolithic period, it, it's, it's very wide how people are disposed of. And when people say that people in the um, hang on a minute, are you still there, guys? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've lost you. Hang on a minute. Um, when, we when put them in the fridge oh, until we got the port. Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, you didn't throw the, You didn't put them in a body bag and put them in the ocean then. No. No. It depends oh. how, how how far from port we were. Yeah. Oh, right. Fair enough, Pete. Um, fair enough. Um, so what I'm going to say is that um, when people turn around to say in the Neolithic period, by the way, everyone in the Neolithic period, only the rich people were put in burial chambers. We're now starting to know that that was absolute, complete rubbish, right? Um, only special people went into burial chambers. Well, maybe that's true. Um, uh, we, we see evidence of that at the Tomb of the Eagles on Orkney. Uh, but that's not the same case everywhere. Um, what we do see at Tinkins with burial chambers in Vale of Morgan is that the, the, the theory used to be that only, only men and women were buried there who were of special status in society. Then we start to find bones of children and elderly people. And then we see a full representation of society. So therefore, when we say only special people were put in there or only elite people were put in there, everyone was put in there, but only small people portion of the population were associated with these burial chambers other times these burial chambers were just swept out they just swept out the rotten bones and just chucked them somewhere else and other people were put in there right so in other words the full the full representation of everything is within these burial chambers but we don't see in any way everybody represented um in society in the neolithic period <clears throat> at these sites hopefully that's answered your question margaret yes, um, yeah. on, that, on that note right Seen, seen as you I'm a bit just worried right. about your image. It, it looks like a bunch of sausages. <sighs> yeah, I get it. It's I get your, it your fingers look like a pack of pork sausages. <laughs> I don't know what's <laughs> happened there. Shut up, you. Uh, right, let's take it. Let's let's just take a ten minute break, and uh, okay. we'll, we'll 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 go from there. I gotta have a cup of tea and a fresh cup. Uh, oh, and by the way, I've just thought I'd mention that next week we are doing Ox the Ice Man. Oh, good. By the way, we're going to do a bit of Barrow Diggers now and we're going to do after this and we're going to do um, the other two things that I wanted us to do. The very boring um, White Horse Hill um, uh, kissed, right? Really boring, but we're going to do it. 
Um, and uh, we're going to do um, the Derry Banks of Loch, uh, Loch Foyle, uh, where we've got a Neolithic building. Well, we're going to take a break now, and you don't need to look at my hands being sausages. Good. And 10 year old uh, diggers. <clears throat> 10 year old diggers. Yeah. Oh. Um, mound diggers, yeah. Certain Ooh. person when he was 10 years old. Yeah. Digging into a mound. Ooh. Yeah, and he shouldn't have been there, should he, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a scheduled protected ancient monument, little. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't have my cup of tea. Shut up, Pete. Shut up, Pete. Shut up, Pete. You're, you're gonna uh, shut up, shut up, shut up. Um, la 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 I've la 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 Aren't there, is it quite spicy? Yeah, I can't stand the taste, but I like them. Mm. Mm. By the way, there was something come up on the screen earlier on. If anybody saw it, it was Stonehenge. No. About Stonehenge? Yeah. No. Hmm. Oh, something. I would like to go and see Stonehenge. I've never seen it. Can you only see oh. it from a distance these days. You're not allowed to go near it, are you? Oh, I know, but, right? I got. Oh, right. Um, I you got, go I got quite away. close, but not through it. No. I got a way. You can. I can get a way. You can see it, and I'll tell you how now. Ooh. Mm. Do you have to know a man? No, you've got to know a woman. Oh. And who is that woman? Uh, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a woman whose name we've mentioned about five or six times today, right? Claire, Claire's got a friend, I think, in Southampton, right? If you can say to Claire, right, Claire, I'll pay for the petrol, right? She, she'll she take you all the way to Stonehenge, right? Um, and she'll see a mate in Southampton and she'll drive back. It's Claire. Oh, I remember that. It's, 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 it's one of those little ruses. Um, um, uh, when, 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 when me and Claire were still deeply in love, we were going to meet up one day and go, go down and see a friend, but it didn't happen. Everyone's gone quiet. <laughs> I don't think Claire's got time these days. She's too busy gardening. I could I couldn't cope with Claire anyway, flipping heck. <clears throat> God. When Claire enters the room, everyone knows she's there. When I when I enter the room, everyone knows I'm there, but Claire's a bit louder. <laughs> She knows her stuff, though, doesn't she? But a bloody laugh can be heard a mile off. <laughs> uh, Claire happens to be watching us. We do love it a bit. <laughs> Apparently, she worked out I wasn't gay because she, she's got a gay da. I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> Does any, ever knew, anyone know what a gay dar is? I've no idea what that is. Gay dar. Well, a gay dar or a lie dar? Gay dar? I don't know. All right. Has uh, 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 Anne managed to get you out on the pop recently? No, well, I haven't seen her. How is she? I'll tell you what, like Wednesday evening. It is definitely entertaining. And um, <laughs> Wednesday morning's entertaining. Uh, Pete, Pete does our Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock and Anne's joined it. Oh. What about Bill? Is he there? No. Um, Bill, Bill, um, Bill's going to be away for a couple of, uh, for about a month because um, something to do with um, Peter upset him and um, <laughs> he, um, he's away for a little while. So Going to Australia or something. 
I don't know, somewhere. Oh, Roger's coming back on Wednesday, right? So it can be, it, you can imagine now Anne and Roger in the same room or in the evening. <laughs> Mmm. Mmm. No, the tail's boiling. Mm -hmm. Oh God. It's 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 uh it's Peter's fault. Do you know what I what I found? If you blame Peter for everything, right, it's fine. <laughs> How is it we we've only got one nil at Blemin the Millennium Stadium against Latvia? We need at least another goal. There's only oh. there's only four minutes left. Oh huh? no, it's seventy six, Pete. A uh, football game? No, it's a rugby game. Rugby's eighty, football's ninety. Oh, of course, yeah. Sorry, yeah. You should know, Pete. You played bloody football against the, the um, Russian Vladi Vostok team. We did, yeah. <laughs> the question: Did you win? No, sadly. Yeah, well, Pete, I, I, I'd have just let him win. Have you seen the size of some of those Russians? <laughs> I thought I was going to get shot. I charged their winger into the into the barriers. He oh, my over. God, Pete. oh, he went over, did he? Yeah, I pretended to be injured. Hmm. Did you pretend to be injured or did he? He did. Oh, I would have pretended to be injured. I would have gone off then, Pete. <laughs> so what are you saying? They, they were on 10 men then, were they? No, no. But was it a five aside, a seven aside, or eleven? No, it was eleven aside. Right, right. We had to pass over bunches of flowers at the start. We were given a bouquet of flowers to pass over to the captain of the next team. Uh... Well, they supplied us with plenty of beer afterwards, so it was good. The problem is, Peter, Peter was saving those flowers for his missus. Flip <laughs> an egg. <clears throat> Who's the manager of the Welsh football team these days? Haig. Haig. No, not Haig. Haig, not William Haig, you silly woman. <laughs> He's a politician. <laughs> Can you imagine William Hague as a bloody football coach? Now, everybody, we've got... Oh, no. we've got what? He, was, uh, he used to do judo. Mm. William Hague? William Hague, he was a black belt in judo. Mm. Mm. I never watch no. football normally because it's bloody boring. Wasn't Ryan Giggs the manager or trainer? Yeah, but they, but they had to get rid of him. It was, yeah, 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 yeah. The thing is, we always used to think that Ryan Giggs would be a good manager, but no, he, 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 he wasn't. My mother always got the name mixed up and she used to tell people, oh, that Barry Gibb was the, the trainer, for, trainer for Wales. Barry Gibb? That Barry Gibb. She couldn't, she couldn't hear very well. <laughs> and she used to get the name Barry Gibb, Barry and say Barry Gibb was the trainer or the manager of the Wales. Mm. Bless her. That's Barry Gibb two weeks in a row now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's here, there and everywhere. Isn't he? <laughs> can, I ask why Barry, but can I ask why Barry Gibb was here last week? He, he, was, was... Uh, he found Oxidio, the um, Iceman. <laughs> oh yeah, Barry Gibb. Barry. Oh, somebody had a right go at me for not pointing out. That they said, "Oh, they said, did you notice know he had a pretty um, he had a pig, a pig hairband." I looked back, and it was blue. Oh, <laughs> it was a blue hairband. <clears throat> Some somebody said they they must they must have been rejects from the um. Oh, oh, God, from the Hamburg um, Oyster Club or something. I don't know. Hamburg <laughs> Oyster Club. 
the, the, the Purple Oyster Club. You know, you don't go to the Purple Oyster Club. Mm. Can you see that, Peter? Oh, yes. That's yes. from my library. Oh, yeah. Is Ooh. it Fleming? Yeah. yeah. Have you got that one? I, I've got an edition of it, but I don't know if I've got that one. Oh, well, this will be an early one, I should think. Are they still using the prison? Yeah. 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 It's well, reduced, they... I think, but... Yeah, I, I know they're reduced, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank Looks you. awful. Right. What, the prison? <clears throat> mm. well, it was never very pretty. <laughs> no. Hang on a minute. I thought you could. I thought you could have day trips going to the prison. No, they've got a little museum, but it's still it's still a functioning prison. Somebody tried to convince me to take them on a trip there. <laughs> I mean, you can't you say they do. Apparently, the museums. I, I don't think I've ever been in it, but apparently, it's quite fun. But it's only a little little like touristy in one of the older uh, outbuildings. Is, One is that's it, not even within the, with you know, it's just outside the prison, but I think it was all built as part of the original complex. Do you hear ghostly howling? <laughs> <laughs> no, not often. Not often, just every now and then, just when there's a full moon. <laughs> Best thing at dark, more is the cream tea at New Bridges. Oh, oh yeah, you gotta have a cream tea. Oh. Ah, but the th hang on, Pete. I've learned something, Pete. Can it? Can it? Right. Okay. In Devon, mm. uh, they put the cream on. The, 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 in Devon, they put the jam on. They do it upside down. Yeah. Yeah, and in Cornwall, uh, they put the cream and then the jam on top. No, you can't do no. that. <laughs> in Cornwall, they put the jam and the cream on top. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the best way. No, what go hang on, hang on, guys. What bloody goes first? Well, right, okay. What what do they do in Cornwall? Have I got this wrong? What goes first? They What's put that? the jam and then the cream. Oh, and in Devon, they put the cream and then the jam. Right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. But I prefer the Cornish way. I think it makes more sense, but <laughs> I'd probably be shot for that. Do you not put butter on your scone before? No, well <laughs> No, get out. It depends how rich you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I put it in my mouth. I put oh, yeah. butter on anything. I love it. Yeah, yeah too it right. It has to be clotted cream, doesn't it? Oh, the, yeah. more, the more the merrier. Yeah. It's a clotted cream. And is it strawberry jam or raspberry? Oh, is it me or do I look increasingly more like Jesus every week? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Then. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Right. Let, let's crack on. Oh, yeah. We were doing Bateman, weren't we? And the Yorkshire. What, 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 oh, right, okay. We we did did a bit of murdering then. Right. So what we're gonna do? Oh, hang. Oh, right. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Oh God. Hang on. Right. Okay. Um. Oh, we don't really need that image. We'll we'll, we'll have it next time. Right. Okay. So um. Right. Okay. Let let let, let me let me get to back to where I was. I used hang to on. work for a man called Mister Bateman. Simon Bateman. He looked just like Henry the Eighth. Hmm. And I always, I get that image in my mind when you're talking about Bateman, <laughs> the archaeologist, I'm thinking about Henry VIII. Henry VIII. <laughs> oh, good luck. Can you just shut up? He's doing my idea. I don't know what you're on about. Um, so anyway, you've got somebody who looks like Henry VIII, then you've got somebody else you know. Did you actually know Henry VIII? <laughs> no, I used to work for a man called Simon Bateman who looked like Henry VIII. Oh, right. Oh, oh, God. Oh, God. So every time I hear the name Bateman, he springs into my mind and I'm imagining Henry VIII. <laughs> right, OK, so you have fantasies about Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> Only during these classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you got out of that one, I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> so, we, we, we've mentioned Carrington and we've mentioned Bateman and then obviously um, the next of the barrow diggers will be um uh will obviously be in about three weeks um so so one thing about these these diggers they they did work sort of um very much together harrington bateman sort of um working on each other's work and there's lots of other people like Llewellyn Dewitt doing these wonderful plans you've got isaacson in the barrow night work in 1845 talking about 
um, all this work that's um, going on. Um, and obviously you've got this play, the, 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 um, the first Barrow digger in his play, Bateman, and in his letters were more than once he described Bateman as sincere but unworthy servant. Um, so obviously a bit of criticism there. He once compared himself as but the fly that sat on the chariot. Uh, Bateman dedicated his 1855 catalogue to Carrington. So obviously when you think about a catalogue, uh, look at all the stuff that goes into this catalogue. I tell you what, it would have been it would have been great to have gone in in, in there, right? I think that's what Claire's base, basement looks like, um, except it's just full of um, orangutans. Um, you can make this up um, as a slight acknowledgement of his assistance derived from an in, indefatigable zeal in the pursuit of science by a sincere um, sincere friend Thomas Bateman. Um, and then basically the, there's various letters that, that go back and forth. And obviously, um, you know, uh, there's a great loss when Thomas Bate Bateman goes because Carrington lives for another nine years. Uh, there was um, lots of people working for Bateman on these various excavations um, as proxies. Bateman's proxy digger in North Yorkshire, they even got as far as Yorkshire, uh, was a guy by the name of James Ruddock, who lived from 1813, 1858. Didn't live a massive length of time either. The contemporary with Thomas uh, Bateman. Details of how he came to be employed appear in Bateman's of correspondence in Sheffield Museum. So all the letters and stuff seem to be kept as well, which is great. Um, in the note in Diggins announcing Ruddock's death, Bateman wrote that the former was for many years singularly uh, imbued with an enthusiasm for antiquarian pursuits. In his case, the ruling passion was strong in death. Nice. Uh, so obviously Ruddock died before Bateman died in 1861, Ruddock dying in 1858. Ruddock was apparently a much more rough and ready digger than the work of Carrington, one of, as we've just mentioned, Bateman's lieutenants. And his reports were <laughs> more scanty. So this is the thing, we've got um, this digger in North York who, who called James Ruddock, who's not as good as uh, the work of Carrington. Um, there's, and this is the thing, when we talk about Bateman, we, we talk about some of his work is brilliant. Um, some of his other work isn't. Some of his health and safety isn't great. And it's probably not helped by the, by the likes of James Ruddock, um, who is not as accurate as Carrington. Um, Ruddock, um, Bateman wrote, were it not for the extreme accuracy of Mr. Ruddock's notes. So, um, so Bateman disagreed, um, but, um, but sometimes Bateman also said that Ruddock's notes were actually quite vague. So one minute his notes are accurate and then other times they're quite vague. Um, Sometimes Ruddock would excavate on mounds and not record anything. And if he didn't record anything, if there was nothing there, he would not write to Bateman about it. It was of six miles north of West Pickering um, and as effective prevented the re-identification of barrows dug by him unless they stood close by well-known landmarks. So in other words, sometimes Ruddock would be excavating and he would put in a report but he would not accurately say where the excavation work actually took place, which is a massive problem. When you've got somebody digging um, and sending the material to somebody like Bateman um, to say, look, you know, we, 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 we want to know what was found. He was, oh, yeah, I did, did, did actually dig somewhere. Uh, but he didn't actually say every time where the excavation took place. Sometimes there would be lots of flints, pottery, stone axes, jetted um, ornaments that were passed to Bateman, but Ruddock would be very vague of where they actually came from. So now we've gone down a very negative um, rabbit hole where that um, some of the diggers working for Bateman were really good. Others weren't that, that good, like Ruddock. Ruddock dug around 100 barrows, and some say he actually excavated. 300 barrows. 
So Bateman worked out from the notes that Ruddock was sending him about and all the fines that he dug 100. But in fact, Ruddock had actually dug 300. <clears throat> it starts to make you wonder, um, you know, on the, the excessiveness of not recording things and why. 90 of these uh, were on the limestone hills around Pickering. Um, a few others were near Whitby, where Ruddock lived for the last few years of his life. Whilst at Whitby, he poached on uh, the preserves of the formidable Reverend um, Atkinson of Danby. Uh, Ruddock told the curious that he had permission to excavate from guardians of the Lord of Danby Manor. Um, a, a doubting employee of the estate informed um, Christopher Atkinson of Derby of his suspicions. Atkinson set inquiries in motion and found out that the entire falsehood of statements was made. So in other words, Ruddock was excavating on land that he had no right to be. Um, however, by this time, the mounds had been rifled and the content sent to Bateman. Ruddock thus appears um, as somewhat of a dis disembler. Unfortunately, beside uh, scruples, he lacked scientific method and his scrappy notes had lessened the undoubted importance of the work. So in other words, Ruddock. So in other words, we, we've got work being undertaken that is of good quality. Um, Carrington Bateman's work, Ruddock work, and for Bateman, it, it's not, you know, nothing like this is, uh, no work like this is published. Um, you know, there are no reports like this made by Ruddock of his excavations, which is a shame. Bateman's death came suddenly late in August 1841, in the 40th year of his life. He was only ill a short time um, and appears to be on the mend when he had a relapse of what referred to as an organic disease. And I don't, we don't really know what that was. At his death, he had personally opened 200 tumuli. Carrington dug into a further 100. Between them, they had therefore um, worked on 300 burial mounds in Derbyshire and Staffordshire Peak, and you could say plundered. That's up to you. Bateman's character was, was touched upon by Jewett in a memorial notice in Reliquy. Um, and basically, um, the work of the work of Jewett actually saved uh, Bateman totally. Um, he was coming up with um, beautiful plans like this. Um, that basically, if it wasn't for Jewett um, associating um, with the written notes of Bateman, um, Bateman would be an understudy in British archaeology, but he'd come a big study because he actually used. Uh, this wonderful draftsman to sort of illustrate his work. If we siphon off the thickly spread um, nature um, of his work, um, you could see the Victorian sentiment as this guy um, could be said to be strict of principle, shy of disposition, cold and lacking um, a sense of humanity to those who did not know him but of generous and kind disposition to his friends. He was a singly, he was, he had a singly fondness for everything relating to the past and particularly to the dead. Nothing could be more interesting to him than researches and inquiries connected with the tomb. Um, and when, when we look at his place of burial, this man who had worked in archeology, span for a very, very short time. Remember, he was 40 years old, so he did quite a lot in archaeology. Um, like many of the many of his predecessors, like Cole Hoare, like Stukely, maybe if they worked a little bit more at their craft, they would have been exceedingly um, advanced archaeologists for their time. But they may have rushed a lot of their work, which was a bit of a shame. But then again, back to what we said, if they didn't work on the mounds that they'd worked on, maybe the evidence would have been completely lost in future generations anyway. We had no time, we had no time in locks of these areas in the dig for Britain to look and to preserve the archaeology. We just had time to dig up the land and that would in invariably destroy the archaeology. Bateman could on occasion exhibit 
um, a sense of annoyance um, in his presentation. At the Canterbury Congress of 1844, he was among those who had visited Heppington to see Fawcett's great collection of Anglo-Saxon antiquities in Quent. Um, as the exhibition, exhibition was in a small room, Rote Smith guided the visitors through in small numbers to prevent overcrowding. Dr. Godfrey Fawcett, one of those great diggers that we've mentioned uh, before, grandson of Brian Fawcett, um, hearing that Bateman was in the party, asked to be introduced to him. So Roach Smith, wishing to give Bateman ample time to speak to the doctor, asked him to rejoin the final group waiting to see the exhibits. Mortally offended at being asked to wait, Bateman um, took himself off in a huff. Although later, when the reasons were explained to him, he apologised for his behaviour. So Bateman had a, a sense of archaeological character. He was a character in archaeology. But in many ways, we can be very thankful for the work that he did do and the work that was published associated with him. And like others of his time, Bateman found difficulty in breaking down the chronology of the burials he disinterred, but he made records nonetheless. Though he distinguished um, Oe, Oe uh, start again. Though he uh, distinguished a stone age followed by one of metal. So in other words, he worked out the stone was before the metal age. So when stone artifacts came after stone artifacts. So we worked that bit out. He established to his own satisfaction. Um, um, he, he would look into, he, he would go into trying to understand uh, differences in skulls. He, he went down a different avenue. He, he, well, this is a rather interesting thing. Um, he would say that people with broad, headed skulls were found in round cans and the ones with longer skulls um, in long barrows. Interesting that. Why he came to that conclusion, we don't, I don't know. He assigned the chambered cans of the peak to the most remote antiquity. So in other words, this is, as we come to the end of this now, we, we know that um, Bateman is actually showing us in Derbyshire that there's more in British archaeology than just the southeast. When the sole material cereal for the spear and arrow was flint. So we're starting to see that um, the sole material for the spear and arrow was flint. We're starting to see a, a great deal of use of flint um, in Derbyshire. And I think what we're seeing is that um, we're, we're seeing that there is a recognition of the Stone Age, but when it comes into the chronology, is at that stage up for debate. Round cans with the short round former skull were um, correctly placed in a later era. Um, interesting that short round former skull were correctly placed in a later era. Um, so in other words, skulls are smaller in, in a later period. It's interesting. Bateman regarded the Khan builders as living uh, centuries, perhaps tens of thousands before the lust of conquest tempted the Roman legions across the channel, but could go no further. He presumed that we had an archaeology. We had people living here before the Romans. And I'm saying that, and Peter knows what I'm talking about there. Um, they remained, they remained um, as a people that were before Rome. He attempted some inaccurate division of burials and grave goods into periods but at least he gave it a try, but said little more about these theories in his later work. Bateman was laid to rest on a hillside at Middleton behind the chapel built by his grandfather in 1827, Thomas Bateman. Among his beloved Derbyshire Dales, it seems fitting that his mausoleum, <coughs> surrounded by an iron rail, is surmounted by a stone replica of an early Bronze Age cremation urn and i think that's actually quite quite a fitting end to this today uh that, that, that he's actually buried in 18 august um 1861 um with um a cremation urn that, that would have been very familiar to him in life um just again looking at these images again jewett's plans in bateman's work um Obviously, Bateman's collection all ended up in museums. I, I think it was all saved, hopefully. 
um from that's what i can get from the notes so okay again, again we're talking about um a vertical um section there and in a, in 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 some ways, in what I've mentioned, we're talking about an individual who learned from his mistakes because that is different from that. So obviously, this is before that. So we get an idea that he shouldn't have done this, and we now know if he had not done this, this this would have been the result. Um, and obviously, um, leaving later archaeology for other people to work. That's 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 what we do today, anyway. Uh, and Bateman, there he is, with the name spelt, spelt, spelt wrong. At least on nine of the barrows that, that have been sent to excavated, we found these little sort of things to show that Bateman had been there, like other um, archaeologists be before him, like Cole Hoare and Stukeley. So what we're going to do now, we won't ask any questions. Uh, we're going to keep flowing. Uh, we might even be finished just after 10. Um, so what I'd like to do now, I'd just like to go to... Um, I'll just mention when we come back to barrow diggers, uh, the big question is the Victorians, um, are these people diggers or desecrators? Um, so in other words, what we're saying, as the Victorian age comes in, people started to say, should you really be digging up these mounds? You know, is it the right thing to do? People were starting to question. What we're going to do next time. Um, so this is very interesting. I want to do this now. And we've got we've got two last bits today of today's lecture. And by the way, Wales won one nil against Latvia. Anyway, nobody's interested in that. But that's why Adam wasn't here tonight. Terrible boy. Terrible boy. Oh, yeah, Adam is with us, isn't he? Oh, never mind. Um, so more more about this in a um, any questions about this later on. So we'll get straight on to the next bit now. Um, I just got to make sure that I've got everything rolling. Right. Okay. Now, this this was mentioned last week by one of you guys or somebody on a Wednesday. Uh, Digging for Britain, prehistoric find shines light on Neolithic life. Look at that. And I'm going to go quickly onto the next image, and we'll come back to this. Look how deep the trenches are for these buildings quite deep aren't they the, these 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 people had big timbers um and obviously you've got post holes as well you know you've got a lot going on there a lot we're not going to go with the reconstruction but i just want us to i just want us to gain this sense of these big rectangular buildings archaeologists uncovered evidence of two large rectangular dwellings dating to around um 5800 years during a 2021 dig at Clooney Road Londonderry this, this is thanks to Henry on the um, Wednesday evening class for bringing this to me. The discovery of a Neolithic um, era settlement is helping shed new light on how people lived on the shores of Loch Foyle um, nearly uh, 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of two large rectangular houses dating back to around, as we said, 5,800 years ago. 2021 um and i just i'm just loving that we've got that type of symmetry um and from evidence of somebody who's nearly completed a roundhouse right um i am never going to build a roundhouse ever again right i will build a rectangular building next time because roundhouses are an absolute bloody nightmare um neolithic building every time all right, Peter, when you've got a couple of a couple of uh, days, right, come down here and we'll build a Neolithic house rectangular. Job done. Mm -hmm. um, Neolithic tools, cooking um, utensils and pottery have been earthed. Experts say that, that dwellings like these found in Derry have rarely been excavated before. We had two from County Court, two sites from County Court last week. So again, loads of stuff. This was on the BBC Two Digging for Britain. I, this was... Uh, this this um, 5th of February, this piece is from 2023, because so it's really new. So obviously releasing these, these results a little bit later. Rectangular homes from this period are seldom found outside Scotland and Ireland, but we really are getting them. Around um, Loch Foyle, specifically, there are quite a few. It, um, now, we know now, we know now. A high density of settlement dated to the early Neolithic that shows around Loch Foyle there are lots and lots of people, uh, Neolithic people living. 
I'm not going to say that I know anything about the Loch Foyle landscape, but I'm just going to chuck in a little earworm. Maybe there were more people living in a Neolithic period within the countryside landscape that are living today. I wanted to say that because this is the same case where I am in West Wales, because somebody said to me once, they said, uh, um, 60 years ago, there was nobody living in this area. Uh, and now there's like um, 20 people, right? But 300 years ago, there would have been 50. So anyway, thought I'd make that point. Um, it's, I, I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to say something here and I, I don't really agree with this because I'm reading this out, but, um, it says, um, the, the lady, um, writing this is called, uh, Katie and she says they were a short lived phenomenon. That means it is even more exciting. I, I'm going to struggle with that because I, I would say that we, we, we get more evidence of Neolithic buildings this shape and form than we do circular. Right. Um, going up to the next point here, this is a oh. really good... Yeah, go on, Andy. Yeah, sorry, I was just remembering that that particular site, it was only but, 20 please. or 30 years that it was rectangular before they changed it to something else. It was a really weird one. But... OK, we're, we're going to go with that because you've mm. got the, the information that we're going to go with that. Um, but what I'm going to say then, Andy, but we, we do get loads of these rectangular square buildings now in the Neolithic period. So so is there a re did they give a reason why it was 30 years is there a reason for that? Anything? Um, they, they'd managed to date it some way or other. And I thought, well, that's interesting because that's that's probably one generation. And I maybe they moved on. I don't know. But it. It was the, that was one of the really weird things about it was they found these, you know, previously unknown rectangular shaped buldings there um, yeah. because all the rest were round. Um, but it, and it and it was only for a short period of time, not a couple of hundred years or anything. But just can I can I, can I make a point, Andy? Right? What, am I overanalyzing it? Why is why is the ground stained in just that area, or is it just because it's been trolled properly? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering whether that's the, that it's a sloping ground on both sides and that's the layer they're down at. But I don't know. I'm assuming they're beam trenches as well, are they? Oh, they're definitely beam trenches. We're going to go on yeah. to that. So the, 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 um, the point that we've made before, Andy, is, is in these buildings, foundations that um, may have supported um, oak planks and structures covered by a large peaked roof um, and dividing that, that idea of dividing dividing walls within a building we know that that's significant yeah uh, when when you get divisions in buildings i always say that that's the next stage of evolution within these buildings i'm actually going to say that i i'm actually seeing that there's a lot more in the sense of building activity there um go, moving on from that point though um i just want to show there, there she is alex roberts there's katie um digging digging for britain in the background there and i'm i'm when you look at when you look at the perspective when you look at this image it's like friggin' hell these are these are massive trenches huge timbers in these huge huge timbers um and it goes on to say circular dwelling um round houses um are more typical of the neolithic period which occurred um um and i i just don't agree with that um, I just don't, I, I'm struggling with that because all the stuff that we've been talking about is rectangular and square. Because um, it was, it's talking about sort of, you know, this idea of um, moving on from nomadic hunter-gatherers and all the rest of it that we don't really talk about now because we, we got over that in the Mesolithic period. Um, there's a lot more in the way, um, talking about hunter-gatherers is really distracting. Don't like it. The dairy settlement where it is located and the way it is constructed is evidence of the shift to a more settled way of life. You can see clearly see that people are really wanting to, to live there. Um, there's another headline coming up. When we were digging it, it out, you could see how, how amazing it would have looked, how deep the foundations were. So these people meant business. The soil, soil is good there and they are in a substantial place with loch foil um, as a resource. It would have been a beautifully wooded area back in the Neolithic. They would have been using that landscape so well. 
The tools and utensils found are also evidence of the advances being made in the Neolithic period on the island of I on the island of Ireland. It goes to say, like a Swiss Army knife, the team from Northern Archaeology Consultancy, who were called in ahead of, of the construction of a modern day housing uh, development, found serrated tools used to strip bark unique to Ireland and a plano convex knife. Plano, I don't know what that is. The late, the latter artifact was used for a little bit of everything, like a Swiss Army knife. Plano, meaning it could be used for a number of different things by the looks of it. Knives like this were used much earlier on the isle, island of Ireland than everywhere else. Surprise, surprise! A grinder stone was found, showing the inhabitants knew how to work grain, how to cultivate the land that they inhabited. It is not the first time evidence of Neolithic period settlement has been uncovered on the banks of the foil. A 6,000 year old village was unearthed in 2000 during an excavation ahead of the construction of Thornhill College, a Colmore area of um, Derry. And finally, 6,000 year old um, axe heads, arrowheads and pottery were among the artifacts recovered from a site which archaeologists said could have been home to about 50 of Ireland's um, earliest farmers. Well, again, my, my idea of farming is a bit earlier than that, but 50 individuals may have lived here, maybe, maybe more buildings. Post-excavation work is now ongoing on the find from Clooney Road. It is hoped some of what the team found will go on public display at a future date. Um, I'm going to make two observations before we go on to the next bit of the lecture, the final bit of the lecture, the, the, the other piece that I wanted to do quickly. Um, um, you know, Ireland is really good for preserving its archaeology. And um, unfortunately, there's no stone structural remains. So, you know, what do you do to preserve a site like this? Do, do, do you backfill these trenches? Do you put a membrane over it? How do you preserve it? Do you need to preserve it? Have we got enough in the record? Uh, it's just an outline. All those questions would need to be asked at a later date. But again, we've got a good record of that. A re really good piece of work. I've got, got to be honest with you, impressed with that. Thank you for bringing us, Alice, Rob, Robert. Uh -huh. Enough. Go on, Andy. So quick. You yep. Go back to that the aerial view. So, um, go, you're asking go, 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 about go, go. the different different colours soil. I think it's been backfilled because that looks like a, a modern drain that's been put in on the right, ready for the building of the estate on it. So I think that's all backfill. So I think the, ah, right. the, the light brown is the is the natural. So. So, so they've left they've left that area and the outskirts yeah. of that. So yeah. okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I'll go with that. Um, right. Fin finally, this last thing comes from Peter. And um, uh, does this is this your? Did you want us to look at this, Peter, or was it Adam? Is he coming on? Oh, God. I've forgotten if who I am, whether I'm Peter or Adam. So oh, you're Adam. Adam. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> you're going to make a claim against me. You've got mental health problems now because of me. Right, go and carry on. Adam. Adam. Uh, yes. I did want you to look oh. at it. Or should I say no, Peter wanted you to look at it? Oh, shut up, you star. <laughs> this is the site, right? Yeah. Uh, very, very um yeah you wanted me to look at this so i'm hoping everybody's just got five minutes and then 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 we'll just do questions right um unfortunately i've left this to the very end and it's it's a rather interesting site so what we are going to do i'm going to just um try i'm going to do this i've got a current archaeology piece here this uh, the kist on white horse hill inside an early uh, Bronze Age burial. So you've got a really nice thick layer of peat below and above, a very peaty landscape. This is in the Bronze Age where people would definitely live here. Kiss this was revealed, White Horse Hill during the um, 2011 excavations. I know this is in fact uh, Bronze Age, but again, it gives you an idea of the environmental change in the Bronze Age. Doors of prehistoric Kiss on Dartmoor were opened by antiquarian investigators in the 1800s. Um, on occasion, their curiosity was rewarded with a flint tool, or if they were very lucky, a pot. More often than not, their endeavours were met with an empty cavity. There you go. Uh, when an eroding kist exposed on Whitehorse Hill was excavated in 2011, it was assumed that the contents would be equally unremarkable. Instead, this exceptional burial is shining new light on an early uh, Bronze Age Dartmoor. Um, 
and objects like this, whoa, 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 like this, and like this. Um, it's too fast. I I know it's too fast. Do, do you know? Do you know what? Do you know what? Right. I might actually. I might actually do this in two bits. Right. And the reason why I'm going to do this in two bits is is there's a lot more to this. So what we're going to do, we're going to start this now. We'll do a bit next week, OK, because otherwise we're going to be going on until 20 past. And I don't want to do that. So we'll, we'll introduce that and we'll we'll start off with this next week and we'll have a look at more, easy, more of these artifacts. Right. Because this is, in fact, the cremated bone and bearskin pelt from the White Horse Hill Kist. Um, a bear skin pelt. That's what we're looking at. And cremated bone. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that the bear skin pelt is the black stuff, and the bone is the white stuff. That would make sense to me. So we'll do a tiny bit of this. This is all from current archaeology. You may, may as well read it out as it is. Today the white um, to the White Horse Hill kissed site could easily be mistaken for a barrow from a distance. The ground that held this burial for almost over 3,000 years stands proud of the surrounding hilltop and rises to form an appreciable mound. It was not always so. In the 1800s, laborers stripped away the peat that blanketed the hill for fuel, leaving only a few isolated stacks or hags, as they are known, standing in their wake. It was the decision to spare one such stack near the summit of the hill that preserved the highest kissed burial currently known on Dartmoor. Whether the modern prominence of the hag is entirely an artifact of the peat cutter's handiwork is impossible to say, as they may have simply exaggerated a natural hummock, hillock. As it stands, the White Horse Hill kissed certainly forms a natural counterpart to the nearby um, hanging stone barrow, with the two burials bookending the windswept ridge that connects them. Can I just make a quick point before we do this last paragraph, and then we'll call it a day. The quick point is this. Um, you know, with all the removal of the peat, um, you're moving you're moving the soil layer, um, meaning that anything that needs to establish or re-establish a tree line there is removed. And I'm I'm always say that when we look at these upland areas, we always see farming and agricultural activity, meaning that at the new to soil goes into the river valleys below, exposes these areas you can't grow anything. But if you're moving if you're moving the peat and the soil, hmm, that's another way of looking at it. Finally, we do not know whether the, um, the, the peat cutters spotted the telltale jumble of stones protruding from the west face of the hag, although one antiquary did note the presence of a kist on the hill. If this was the one lodged in the peat stack, it certainly escaped the more hands-on attention that many of its brethren on lower ground attracted during that era. Obviously, in the, on the lower ground, it's easier to work in it. In these upland areas, it's a bit remote. You might be chased by a dog. Um, instead, the White Horse Hill burial remained intact during the 1800s heyday of kist exploration on Dartmoor, a past equally unremarked through the 1900s until the 1990s when the visible stones were recorded. Until the 1990s, mm, still a lot to be found in that area, as uh, Pete Adam will tell us. Further work by Historic England followed in 2005. By 2011, it was clear that the hag <clears> was <throat> drinking at an alarming rate due to a combination of peat drying out and the accelerated erosion experienced in such an exposed location on peat The first excavation of Dartmoor kissed for over half a century was mounted in response. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, at the start <laughs> of next week's late lecture. There's a lot to be seen here. Uh, and um, and we'll just we'll show we'll show what the other um, um, that there is the studded cattle hair bracelet shown um, as it was excavated, um, and um, that looks to me as a background of wood, doesn't it? Is that wood? Anyway, so we'll, we'll come on to this next week, and um, and the cremated bones show that the individual were there was of the age of fifteen to twenty five. Um, on that note. That is me done today. We will come back to this next week because I think this is too far an interesting um, site to just sort of flipping, flippingly um, go over in a very, very short period of time. And also, 
this is for you, Pete, right? I'm not telling you what these are. You can work that out for next week. And no guessing now. Right, next week, Pete, job done. So we're going to call that a day now. And it's um, um, we, we are going to go straight to um, 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 David. Um, and David, have you got any questions this week? I'm sorry it's been a long one. Dave, anything you'd like to say? No, oh, thank you. Good night, thank all. You. Bye. Good Bye, night, David. David. Bye, David. Oh, best of luck with your cast getting out Bye, next week. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, David. Bye, Get David. Just, um, it's good to know a bit more about David. Uh, we've had him for a long time, and, and uh, eventually you slowly get to know him. We know he's got a niece now, so that's good. And we, yeah, good. Um, yeah, I don't like, I, I don't, I feel that David is isolated, but if he's seeing his niece every day, that's really good. I'm liking that. I, I'm, I like it. Don't have to worry about him anymore. Uh, Pat. Um, well, there were three words that were used interchangeably. And these words were uh, barrow. Barrow, Barrow, Cairns, right, but, uh, Tamuli. Right, okay then. Uh, basically, they're all the same thing. That's what I thought. But why? Um, right, when? so what, what we're going to gonna do, um, right, the word Barrow, I'm going to add Dolman in here as well, right? Oh. <laughs> right, Barrow, Barrow is the word used in Wales and sort of Wiltshire for earthen mounds um, and with, with stone underneath, right? Um <laughs> Um, a khan or a kist is associated with a stone mound um, or a stone <clears throat> burial place with a lot more stone being used, basically just stone. Um, Tumuli uh, are basically the category for all of them. So any mound in the landscape is a tumuli. Tumuli is, um, is plural for tumulus, right? Dolmens are basically big stones that stick out of the ground, right? Which are also stone chambers, but basically <coughs> big pieces of stone rather than the smaller bits of stone, which are kist and arms. Is that is that is that does that cover all the ones you mentioned? Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pat. Anything else you want to say, Pat? No. Thank you. Okay, Pat. Are you, are you staying or are you going? I'll stay. <laughs> oh, well done. You're a stayer. Good. You're a keeper. Uh, Andy's also a keeper. Andy, anything you'd like to say? No, no, it's very interesting, this all this stuff. Thank you very much. Every time you dig yeah. up one and you see the pictures, I think, oh, I want to do that. I want to look at that. I want to. <laughs> mm. uh, and and you, you know what? I told you, Andy, right, that the Neolithic period and obviously my interceded Bronze Age stuff is, 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 is such a, a long, massive subject. We haven't even done my favourite causeway enclosures yet. Hey. But, they, they 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 are my favourites, right? Oh, forget the blooming, forget the um the avenues and and the cursus monuments. We've done enough of them, right? But we haven't done long barrows, right? Uh, we haven't done any of that stuff yet. Um, right, okay. Um, right. Uh, um, let's do another woman, Pete. <laughs> Not for me, no. Oh, it could have been either of you. Ah, oh, no. one of you. One of you manned up. One of you manned up. Um. Right, so let's talk about the big boy in the group, Adam. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, no, no, I thought that was very interesting. Um, there's some mixed mm. behaviour from certain bar barrow diggers in being very accurate in places. And then, mm. did you think it was just on the day how interested they were? That, you know, if they um, were into it that day, they, they got lots of good notes and stuff. And if they only found a couple of bits of pot, they were just like, oh, no. Nah. <laughs> Can I, can I can I can I can I just can I just explain? Um, you do get lots of other people, um, lots of the other diggers. Um, there, there was um, oh god, there was. Hang on a minute, I'll get the name of the guy now. Hang on. Um, where 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 is he? Um, there, there was one chap. He was so into it, and and he you know and and um, I can't remember the name. He, he, Reverend something or other. He, he you know he was one of those that. that like to make sure all the uh, uh, I's are dotted and a uh, very conscientious. There's some really conscientious people, mm. um, and some were like Bateman. They they were in the middle of being extremely brilliant, and then they they fell down uh, on their own sword occasionally. Uh, this guy Samuel Pegg, if you remember him, he was really sort of on on the. Um, on the bestie uh, um, end, you know, and he he, he died in um, 1796. In other words, there was a long way to go, and and, and people were learning and, and sort of relearning and 
I, I, and I think it was should be more more. Uh, you know, the question that you mentioned, was it very much from the day that that's what I was going to come to? Um, as as an archaeologist of many years, um, I, I, I know what it's like to I know what it's like to uh, manage excavations. And it, it's the it's the person who's managing the excavations feels for me um, that it's one of the most loneliest jobs in the whole, whole planet. Right. Because all the pressures on you. Right. It's the most tedious managing an excavation where everybody else is having so much fun and they're finding things and, and so on. Down on the level of an excavator level um, it's the most refreshing, wonderful job in the world because you can just work all day and find nothing. And it's still as good as finding something. Right. Mm. Uh, but um, on the level of the archaeologist, um, the one who's coordinating this, it can be. Uh, the most fraught, one of the most difficult things. Um, there's lots of archaeologists who had mental breakdowns managing excavations. Um, if any of these people were like um, some of those archaeologists, then, you know, it, it, it's on the day. However, the diggers, I would say it's never on the day because the diggers are always the same. Mm. Um, it's, if you're a digger, it's the same feeling. I'm sorry, if it's not the same feeling, you shouldn't be an archaeology, right? So it's the same feeling. The amounts of people I say, I just want to do this, but it's pouring down with rain, you're soaking wet. I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you haven't found anything. I'm loving it. I just want to go home, right? But um, but I can't because I'm managing the excavation. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm very careful to know that the work I've got to do here is on the backdrop that I've got to publish some of my excavation reports. I refuse to do any more excavation work until I've published some of my excavation reports, at which point I will be happy to do more work. So uh, have we done everybody? Oh, no, we haven't done the last woman in the group. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, no, sorry, Margaret. Well, I was just intrigued to hear, I don't know if it was Bateman that said, he thought that the long skulls went in long barrows and the big round skulls went in round barrows. Was it Bateman that said that? Yes, that was Bateman, yeah. I wonder if he noticed that because uh, he'd got them all lined up on shelves in his room, didn't he? I wonder if that came after quite a, a lot of studying of the skulls on his shelves. It, it, do you know? Do you know what? That's a really deep subject, and um, uh, and I would say the, the Anna Nurbe, um, as instituted by Heinrich Himmler on the first of July, nineteen thirty-five, would 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 agree that um, skull shape is very much um, an important area of study in archaeology. Um, um, Bateman's ideas and theories could just be flippantly. Um, coincidental um mm. but it's a very interesting idea um I, i'm loath to go any further with that because yeah. um i really don't understand i don't really don't understand the the the, the connection i need, need a bit more that 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 was just a last sentence with three cent with with that was the one paragraph with three sentences you know round for round barrows and and whatever long for long barrows yeah exactly it, about it, it's, people it's, with deformities they buried them ah, the deformities. Um, Tomb of the Eagles, Orkney, end of story. Ah. <laughs> you know, oh, it's, the well, first it's, the first, it's the first museum I've ever been to where I've got a group of people and somebody's handing around a human skull mm. uh, from five and a half thousand years ago. Ah. Um, it was a very weird experience, that museum. And um, yeah, and not wearing gloves and stuff when these people... Yeah, anyway, it was really weird. I'm not going to criticise it because it was a good experience for everybody and I'm not going to criticise an experience. So, oh, Pat was on in on that one. Pat, did yeah, you hold the skull? It, it was a tiny museum. I was busy looking down through the glass, that everything that was under the glass. I think I even took pictures of stuff. You know, that was glass, you know. But I, I don't remember the skull. It didn't register. I used to be a biology teacher, you know, none of that stuff bothers me, you know. I, I say I think Kathy I think Kathy held it and Bill held it you know and I oh, think um, I Clive didn't. held it and, and David you know so uh, I didn't <laughs> no no you didn't I think it was the day that um, Clive's son was ill or something I don't know oh dear well, that's when my camera fell off me remember we had to go in there foot first with a rope <laughs> oh no 
to get into the eagles, whatever. And I the eagles, off, yeah. my camera was laying on my chest. And of course, it just fell off into the ground. Oh, no. And it, it was just nothing, you know, you look nothing. <laughs> I was just, well, I got a new camera out of it. So <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was like a you know, mechanic, you know, you pull the rope and you go underneath the, you know, yeah. Yes, that. exactly. It was that tall, you know, what, two feet? Uh, I, <laughs> uh, yeah yeah exactly i would say that you were very lucky because now the site is closed because it was um it was a father and daughter thing wasn't it and and didn't she just lose lose a dad or something oh um, and she was running the museum by herself and it was just uh, i think it was a lot of work for her yeah yeah oh dear hmm. so um yeah that's but that's been yeah it was good we stood inside there a long time and looked around and, and you were very, very lucky, as I say, because now it's closed. Well, it was probably a hazard dragging people in by their feet. <laughs> uh, yeah, and 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 we we also went to that. Um, we also went to the um, <clears throat> to the burnt mound site as well, where where we where where there was big piles of stone, and and they had these little holes in the ground that they used to put the stones to heat the water and so on. Oh, so we, yeah. yeah, the burnt mound site. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, what, 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 a, what, a, what a, that, I gotta be honest with you, as, as trips to Orkney go, that, that was, that, that was, um, yeah. you know, and definitely up there. Yeah. It was mental. Was it was great. Seven days it was. I couldn't believe it was seven days. <laughs> yeah. Se se seven days, um, of, of absolute, uh, greatness. Um, and, uh, obviously I, I ran, you know, we, we had a, we, we had another trip there. The problem is that the, the trip the following year that I had, was so so stressful because I was fitting so much into it, and there was a guy who was an alcoholic on it. Oh my god! Oh, god. oh dear. Well, you didn't want to take people back to the same place they went, the ones that had been before, but then the other people wanted to go to these places, so you must have had a terrible dilemma. You know? Oh yeah, it was a massive dilemma. It was huge. It, it, it was it was um, uh, uh, close after seven days. I I was having some kind of breakdown. It was just it was it was really intense and um third time didn't you yeah we, we no we, we 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 went we went i then i took a third time peter and and bill kathy um uh, michelle and the two children and me so so we we had another trip there um and that that was that was a little bit more chilled out except for bill insisting that i cook him breakfast <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! Do you know? Do you know what? I, I, do you know what? Having to go out buy all the breakfast stuff at well, eleven o'clock at night at the uh, only I only... fed you cheese sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay then. I'm happy with the cheese sandwiches, Pete. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't buy anything else. Oh, anyway. and you had me driving as well. <laughs> oh, stop bloody moaning. Do you know what really got on my nerves? Right? A bill insisted that he goes on the insurance and he did like one hour's yeah. worth of driving. <laughs> that really pissed me off. <laughs> God. And you drove oh. us down that lane to that little that little, that little that railway station. Never the again. That railway was my station fault. where we couldn't turn around. We had to move the furniture and everything to turn the bloody van round. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I must be off. I'm crashing. Oh, we're, 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 all gonna be, we're all gonna be we're all gonna be off. What I'm gonna say quickly. Um, um anyone got anything else they want to say? Uh Peter, Peter, and no, Adam, no, no. Pat. Um, anyone got anything else to say? <laughs> no, Margaret? No, no. You in two Adam. weeks. Good night, all good night. Good night. Okay, then everybody. Bye. 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 See you all next Bye. week. See you. Have a nice yeah. time in the Isle of Man, Pat. No, 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 no. Bloody hell, that all that all went off quickly. Um. Anyway, thanks for everybody watching online as well. And uh, that that was a good one. Everyone seemed to disappear. Am um, I going to look in the chat box now? Um. We've we've basically got to ten eighteen. Nothing in the chat box. One, two, three. Um. And thank you, Pazu, for watching. Everybody, no, no, thank you very much for that recording. And um, not many comments online today.